Uh, I'm going to call this uh, meeting of the Littleton City Council to order on December 19th, 2023. Uh, City Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Schlachter. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Barr. Here. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Peters. Here. Council Member Reichardt. Here. Council Member Ryden. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Council, everyone's had a chance to review. Any changes to the agenda? No changes. It's approved without objection. Item four on the agenda is uh, our public comment period. <clears throat> uh, public comments and opportunity to express opinions regarding issues that are not part of public hearings on tonight's agenda. A separate opportunity will be provided to provided for comment for any public hearing tonight, which would be the uh, historic designation and then the rezone. If you're here to speak to either of those, now is not the time to talk to those. We'll have an opportunity later during those um, issues. Uh, each speaker is limited to three minutes. When you hit your three minute mark, I'll let you know. Uh, we expect comments to be civil, disrespectful, disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. Council is not authorized to take action on any issue raised by public comment tonight that's not part of tonight's agenda. I will refer matters to the city manager or city attorney for immediate comment if necessary, uh, or to staff to obtain uh, additional information as appropriate. We have several people signed up here. Um, if you haven't had a chance to sign up, I will give you a chance at the end after all this. Uh, first up, we have John Marchetti. Good evening, Council. My name is John Marchetti, and I live in District 4. I've gone to a number of neighborhood developer meetings over the last four months. Two of the biggest citizens' concerns are traffic and lack of neighborhood developer notification. Citizens are concerned about how new developments at Broadway and Fremont, Bellevue and Federal, Mineral and Lottie, O'Toole's, Mineral and Santa Fe, and other locations will affect our current traffic problems. Littleton would benefit from a citywide traffic study. The second concern is the minimal notification requirements for not uh, neighborhood developers' meetings and zone variances. A blanket distance of 700 feet is not the answer for larger developments, and 700 feet is overkill for someone looking to get a variance to do an addition to their garage. Having a set di distance for all development projects is just not the answer. It needs to have a component of both distance and number of affected stakeholders. Citizens have asked to have the ULUC's 700-foot notification area amended in the past. Again, including it in the 2024 ULUC round of changes would answer the citizens' questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next up is Karen Talentire. Merry Christmas. I am still going through the data Arapahoe County put out about the latest election, which is not particularly my job, but as a citizen, it is my responsibility to check up on my representative government. From this public information, I looked up all of you, so I know the method each of you on the council used to vote. I know your address and phone number and which day you voted. Actually, it was interesting to see which of you, like me, don't do early voting. You could find the same information about me because this is public information shared with the world whether we like it or not. But for some reason, it is private information how exactly the election machines that we paid for it count our votes. Oh, and remember the overseas voters who got their ballots by email, and we can only hope the email addresses were good, and how there were more email voters voting from overseas on a property tax and school board election than people who voted in person here. Well, I looked, and at one address, there were nine overseas email voters with the same last name, all of whom were voting from Israel. 
I went by the house and it appears to be a normal house with a family living there and no indication where they would put the nine people when they aren't overseas, nor any indication why all nine decided to be overseas during the election, but voted. In summary, it looked very much like nine people who probably don't exist. I found another address was in Littleton near a friend of mine. She knew the other voters at that address but did not know of the overseas voter. So, so far in my very un informal checkup on 10 overseas email voters, zero of them have any clear proof of existence. Overseas voters mostly voted by email, less than a third of them by mail. That makes some sense for the convenience, I guess. But for some reason, 23 of these overseas voters voted in person, including one from Littleton. She, like many overseas voters, is listed as an overseas voter, but with no overseas address. She voted the day of the election in the place where I was poll watcher. So this could have actually happened in front of me and poll watchers are supposed to challenge a voter who might be ineligible. But as poll watcher, I had no way to know, much less question, why an overseas voter is one of the few people voting in person. One overseas voter voted in person, not using the ballot marking device, which fills in ovals for adults who failed shape coloring in first grade. This Greenwood Village guy with an address in Germany who could have voted by email, for some reason voted here in person on paper. I'd be really curious to ask him why. Arapahoe County says elections are safe and secure, so why can an amateur like me find irregularities like this in my spare time? Again, all this is from public data put out by the Arapahoe County Clerk's Office. Littleton should stop outsourcing elections to Arapahoe County. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is John Gherkin. It looks like you listed the historic landmark home. If you'd like to speak to that, there'll be a time later in the meeting for that. Great. Next up, Pam Chadbourne. Good evening, Council. My name is Pam Chadbury. I'm a block and a half from here. So my first comment is about item 9A, general business. Um, this, it's about the DDA op plan and budget. Um, the staff communication says, per state statute, the DDA must submit their plan of development to planning commission for recommendation and then to city council for approval. However, I could be wrong. The staff report doesn't seem to list the date of the planning commission consideration and recommendation. And I'd like to ask you that uh, staff amend the staff communication and confirm that in fact the state statute was met and when planning commission met to consider the DDA op plan, I would not sign it if I didn't have that on the communication. It's not in the resolution, it kind of smears over it. It just says, oh, it, we complied with CRS 31, et cetera. Um, I would like that site. Um, I also have said this before. I think the operating plan, uh, the GDA has worked hard and they mean well. And, uh, but the operating plan has expanded dramatically from the list of things that the group that, the stu that studied the DDA in the bid worked 18 months to talk about. It's huge, and when, <laughs> when the DDA formed, a packet was prepared for them of things to consider. The next thing I saw was that the op plan had been expanded to include the whole wish list, and I think that's too broad. I don't think it reflects the needs or wants or desires of the community. I don't think most of the community knows it was in there. In fact, that was only done at DDA meetings, and I know the public is simply not aware of what happens there. Um, there's also a claim in the communication that the voting was overwhelmingly in support of the DDA. Uh, for the record, I think the staff communication should note that um, a residency on Littleton Boulevard asked to be excluded from the district. They came in numbers to the DDA meeting. The consultant had to recognize them and they spoke and said, we want out. In June, I think it was, there was an executive session by the DDA. They reconvened and said, we're going to vote on what we voted on for legal advice 
about that residency, but I don't know what it was. And I don't know whether those residents are satisfied. So already we know that there's an exception to people who said we didn't get ballots and we don't want to be in there. And the record should show that. Um, I would not sign this and I would like the staff communication amended, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up is, looks like it says Pat McCall, Pat McCann. Good evening, City Council. My first ask of the City Council is not to approve the Lumen zoning change. The Lumen site so, does Sir, not if, there, if you're here to talk that, there's a separate public hearing for that tonight. If you wish to speak to that agenda item at that time would be the appropriate time to speak to that. And that's tonight? Or That'll be tonight, time? yes. Okay. Then I'll go to my second ask. Um, my second ask is that the Littleton Land Use Code needs changed to include infrastructure reimbursement to the city by the developer. The Littleton infrastructure needs updated, but not for all those costs should be borne by the citizens of Littleton. And then I would reiterate what was said by another speaker. My third ask, and I know the city council has now considered this twice, but the 700 foot notification needs to be expanded for developments such as Lumen. Thousands of citizens along Mineral from Santa Fe to Broadway will be impacted by this development. Please consider these changes. Thank you. Thank you. That's all that's signed up um, for this public comment period. Is there anybody else in the audience that wish to speak under this general public comment? See no one, we will continue on. Next up, we um, have. Mayor, if I could just uh, answer Ms. Chadbourne's question. So, our planning commission approved or recommended approval of the plan of development for the DDA back on April 24th. The, can you speak into the mic? I thought I was. So, I would say that. Planning Commission approved the DDA's plan of development on April 24th. Planning Commission is not in charge of, of approving their budget. That is a city council function. All right, thank you. Uh, council reports, I'll start with Councilmember Driscoll. Sure, thank you. Uh, last week I had the opportunity to attend um, uh, a dedication of an AED device. It's a defibrillator for just simple terms. And this was, uh, uh, presented by the uh, Littleton Hospital, Adventist Little Hospital. They have donated nine of these devices to the different uh, schools and placed around the uh, uh, soccer fields or baseball fields, wherever, so they're readily accessible. So I'm really excited to be a part of that board and, and see what they're doing out there to help out uh, anybody that might have some uh, heart issues while playing a sport or for any, uh, for any reason. Also attended a couple ribbon cuttings, uh, again, just welcoming Denver Beer Company and also uh, Sincali uh, Takarita. Uh, really excited to have those two in, in uh, town. I think there were a couple other, but I only attended those two. Um, also attended the Littleton Business Chamber holiday party, uh, really a fun event, raised some good funds for the Littleton uh, Police uh, Department. And then uh, finally tomorrow, uh, we have a, a Littleton Downtown Development Authority meeting. Uh, that was already addressed, but tomorrow, Wednesday at 4 o'clock, if you want to come and listen in. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Ryden. Yes, thank you. Um, just a thank you to many of our community members who came out for our Tri-Cities Homelessness Policy Work Group annual meeting between Sheridan, Littleton, and Inglewood City Council. It was really great to see a lot of the community come out for that as well, um, and for all of you who were able to be there. And then just a reminder to everybody that the library has voting for their 25 entries for the gingerbread contest. So vote through, um, through Saturday, I believe. Um, stuff the ballot box, I guess, right? Um, there were some reports of some of the, the kids uh, doing that. It was really cute um, in a playful way, not like. Um, but uh, check that out. That's just like a little fun thing that our community does. And I'm hoping to have the winner of that contest be put on display here in city council, or at least show a picture of it. Thanks, that's all. Thank you, Councilmember Peters. Yeah, I had my first couple real weeks on the job. It's busy. Um, I got to 
go to the business chamber party and the Denver beer event, which was lovely. Um, got to sit in with the South Metro housing options as well. So much to learn there, but I'm excited to be a part of that. Um, and then sit in with the housing task force and planning commission meeting last Monday as well. Um, and then the South Suburban, I'm also the liaison with council member Grove and that is something I'm looking forward to learning more about and um, communicating with South Suburban on how they serve the city. Thank you, Councilmember Rickert. Thank you, I feel like I'm also um, underwater and slowly catching up. Um, uh, and the Denver beer event was a good way to feel better about that, um, which I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, the other things I participated in, I went to one of the one of the Kettering Gallup Park master plan uh, public sessions and learned a lot about the plans for, for that park. Uh, the Tri-Cities meeting that Gretchen mentioned was um, really informative and I really appreciate all the work that the people have put into that. That was, that was a great opportunity. Um, I wanna say thank you to Jim for spending extra time with me yesterday. He took an extra hour um, to uh, help bring this um, person up to speed, so I really appreciate your time. I really enjoyed it. And then I want to apologize ahead of time. I'm still getting my calendar in order, and I just got the um, notification for the Transportation Mobility Board meeting later this week, and I'm going to miss that, so I want to apologize ahead of time. I really appreciate the work of that uh, board, and I, I look forward to being involved, but I'm not able to make it this time. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Grove? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, I attended a, a meeting uh, with the uh, South Platte Working Group on the City Ditch. And for those of you that are not aware of it, um, they're going to basically pipe the City Ditch because it's no longer effective to um, have water go through it, it evaporates. There's two areas um, that are right now part of the City Ditch where we hope to maintain the swales. So it, we uh, can talk about the historic significance of those ditches, of those uh, sections of the ditch, and that will be at Lee Gulch. And also the other one was Slaughterhouse Gulch. So uh, looking forward to maybe working with South Suburban. We've mentioned it to him at our subcommittee meeting that I was with uh, at, uh, to see if we can do some interpretive signs and kind of help explain uh, what's going on there and uh, the importance of the city ditch to our, the history of our city. We also had a legislative breakfast where we had uh, people from the state legislature and we talked about some of the things that are, are important to city council. One of the things that was especially important was um, a modification of Proposition 123 in terms of how we can uh, uh, count affordable housing and we made the point that um, preserving affordable housing should be counted towards that and so we're looking into maybe an amendment that proposition to see if that's something um, that we can do in order to participate in that program. Uh, I also went to a Highline Canal Collaborative meeting, and uh, I, I don't know how many of you know this, I kind of found out at the meeting that Denver Water is gonna transfer ownership of the Highline Canal to uh, the counties, and they're starting with Arapahoe. Uh, they'll keep a portion in Douglas, but Adams and Denver may assume ownership uh, of the canal. The conservancy will retain the easement, the conservation easement of the canal. So things are changing as uh, Denver water is uh, moving away from that. Another thing that um, I attended was uh, Colorado Municipal League, the policy committee meeting. And at that meeting, uh, the lobbyists bring certain bills that they are watching, and they have to do with a variety of things like uh, economic development, ADUs, housing, taxes, uh, punishment for people who harass uh, 911 operators. And the policy committee meeting listens to what the bill is and where the lobbyist recommends we stand, either su uh, support it or not support it or possibly neutral. And then um, that recommendation then goes up to um, the committee who then makes the final recommendation on what CML is going to do in the position they're going to take. I also attended uh, the Littleton Chamber Gala, which was lovely and raised a lot of money for our police force. I think it was $12,000 and they're going to buy e-bikes, which will be great. Uh, so that will be used, that was wonderful. Um, I also attended the Ribbon Cup 
uh, cutting at Sentikali, if I'm saying it right, Takaria. And I did not have the margarita and I didn't have the food, but boy, it looked good. So uh, please support our, lo our new local business. Uh, the Homeless Initiative Joint Council uh, was a very good opportunity to br be brought up to date. All three councils were brought up to date on what's going on with that and where we've been and where we're going. And it's all good in order um, to help our unhoused population. Uh, on Saturday, I also went to a pop-up for our Broadway project, which was the last uh, one that they were doing. And it's kind of interesting. Instead of doing a meeting, which is lots of people don't attend, take a lot of time, they have a pop-up so that people could come in and hear what's going on on the Broadway project and then give their input. So it was a very effective way to engage the community. Thanks. Mayor Pro Tem Barr. All right. A um, couple quick announcements. I, I just want to highlight and recognize Council Member Ryden's work on the Tri-Cities Homelessness uh, Initiative and how instrumental that's been in having Littleton's voice in the mix. And not just in the mix, but also kind of leading the way. I was really heartened to hear at the conclusion of the meeting uh, propositions around 30% uh, area median income, affordable housing, and below being a focus of the Tri-Cities group in the future. Um, that We know that uh, keeping folks in a home, having the ability to buy or rent a home um, when you are working in poverty wages is instrumental to um, help, helping prevent homelessness. So I'm excited to see what the future of the working group has in store for us in the coming year. Um, one other uh, quick announcement, um, the Environmental Stewardship Committee, um, so Council is aware, they have been working diligently on their recommendations for kind of the master planning of our their their goals, the the anticipated focus areas for the for our city's engagement in environmental stewardship and sustainability. And they have been working on this diligently, but they are not going to be meeting the end of year deadline, which is um, imminent, uh, according to my calendar. So the proposed uh, deadline that they'll be delivering their recommendations to council is Earth Day in April of 2024. Um, and I will say at the last meeting I attended, there was a really rigorous and well grounded and um, thoughtful discussion about water resources management, stormwater infrastructure um, investment, things of this nature. I know the, the committee is working on a wide variety of topics, but again, I was impressed by the diligence and the expertise they're bringing to bear on it. So that's all I have to report. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, just a few things for me. Uh, one of the other businesses that opened with ribbon cutting was um, Daddy's uh, Chicken Shack, which is over in Littleton Village. So I know people over in Littleton Village have another uh, dining option over there. Um, has a good, good chicken sandwich. Um, let's see, uh, last week uh, the city manager and I attended the Arapahoe County uh, Mayor's, Managers, and Commissioners breakfast. Uh, where we were joined by members of the governor's office to kind of go through and talk about some of the, the legislative preview of some of the bills that they're running. We had a, a good conversation. Um, a lot of the, the, the topics uh, around housing and land use that we're in 213 are kind of be separated out there. And it, it seems that there's a, a, a different approach to be more um, inclusive with the communities, listening to them, and uh, a little more incentive based on having some funds go towards those. So we'll see what those look like when they're actually introduced and get in the legislature. But um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that'll go better than last session did. Um, so uh, one of the other thing is uh, I, I listened to a webinar on the front range passenger rail. If you're not aware of that, there. Uh, an organization is looking to get rail from uh, Fort Collins onto Pueblo. Uh, with about seven or eight stops along the way. This is different than light rail, it's, uh, it's passenger rail, so it'll be uh, higher speeds uh, using the existing um, rail lines, not light rail lines, but it does seem that they are planning for it to come through our corridor here. Uh, there'll be a stop in Denver, a stop in Castle uh, Rock, but also a South Metro stop, which they haven't identified the location, but from the drawings, it kind of looks like it is either mineral, near Mineral Station or near downtown Littleton. They don't know yet, but that's something to keep in mind. Hopefully they'll be um, having the on the tracks in 10 years um, is the goal. They just received funding federal government to keep moving with that. So that's coming. Uh, I know talk to the city manager about that. Staff's gonna be paying attention to that and seeing how we can advocate best for our community here. Um, I also attended a Hanukkah celebration at Bega Park uh, last Saturday, and it was a good celebration. I think next year they're looking to have a few more people, so we'll work with the city to help get the word out a little bit better with that. But uh, 
Um, and as you, you may or may not be able to tell, uh, I'm kind of in the holiday spirit with uh, our, our suits here. Uh, there's uh, Christmas is coming up next week. Uh, New Year's, no meeting next week. So we'll get a, a nice uh, week off. So wish everyone a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to the city manager for any update. Just one mayor to follow yours. Just a reminder that uh, city offices will be closed on Friday after 12 noon. So uh, we're, we're open till noon and then we'll be closed in observance of, of, of Christmas Eve. City attorney, any fashionable uh, legal advice tonight? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we tend not to get into national politics, but there was a very interesting uh, ruling from our Supreme Court regarding a potential presidential candidate. I won't get into that, but uh, found that pretty interesting. It's um, pretty groundbreaking, so I'm sure we'll, Colorado will be in the news uh, going forward over the next month. Um, uh, to echo some of the, the comments that you yourself have made, as well as Council Member Grove, we have seen kind of a trickling out of some proposed legislation similar to uh, legislation that was tried to be advanced last year um, surrounding ADUs. Um, which would be allowed in all residential areas, um, TOD development, including kind of parking restrictions, if you will, um, as well as STRs are in the nude from, news from a, a state perspective. I, I will tell you, we'll find out um, what comes into fruition and what gets advanced in the next legislative session. I will tell you from kind of a municipal perspective, um, at least in in regard to TOD and ADUs, they still deal with preemption, um, which is something that historically has not been received well by a lot of municipalities. Um, other, other comment I guess I would bring up is really just more an FYI. So back in 2021, uh, our state legislature um, went about a process of banning uh, plastic bags. So effective January 1st, most of the retailers in which you would typically get a plastic bag, King Supers, whatnot, um, should not be giving those. And so for those of you with recyclable bags or um, those types of things, you should probably bring those with yourself. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you. Sure. I'm sorry. I don't know what an SDR is. I'm sorry. Uh, Short-term rentals. Sorry. We, You'll get used to the 900 acronyms that we use. I apologize. I appreciate you holding my hands with us. Thank you, everyone. And Thank ju you. just for the clarification, that I believe that was the bill that was looking at uh, uh, classifying them as commercial land use rather than residential land use. There, so correct. Yeah. yeah. So it, if the proposed legislation went forward, what it would do is it would instruct kind of county assessors to value that property out. As, no longer as a residential property, but as some kind of variation of commercial. So presumably higher property taxes for STRs. Thank you for that help. Thank you. Next week, you better have all the acronyms memorized, or in two weeks, all right? <laughs> all right, that's it. We have uh, item next in the agenda, uh, scheduled appearances. We have no scheduled appearances. Item seven, proclamations, no proclamations. Um, item 8 is consent agenda. We have one item on consent agenda. We have a motion to approve the minutes of the December 5th, 2023 regular meeting of the City Council. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of December 5th meeting. Any discussion on that? Seeing no discussion, I'm going to open the voting. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right, item number nine, general business. We have one general business item tonight. It's resolution 113, 2023, approving the 2024 operating plan and budget for the Littleton Downtown Development Authority. Uh, we'll have staff presentation and we can ask questions and have a motion in a second. Let's turn over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, the uh, state statute governing downtown development authorities requires the uh, submittal of an annual operating budget uh, or operating plan and budget for the coming year to the uh, city council for approval. Um, since the uh, DDA is a separate entity from the uh, city, the, uh, the uh, approval largely exists to ensure uh, coordination and communication between the uh, agencies. Um, as, I, as I know we have 
you know, through the, the early relationship with our DDA, um, have worked well, I, I believe, to, uh, to ensure that the DDA operating plan and budget coordinate well with the city's plans for, uh, uh, the, for the downtown. So I'm sure you'll hear more about that. I'm going to turn it over briefly to our assistant city manager, Kathleen Osher, who has been the uh, city's liaison with the LDDA. And then I know we have, uh, we have our representatives from the LDDA who can review their plan. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Kathleen Osher, Assistant City Manager. So you'll remember about a year ago, for those that you were of you that were on Council, that we had a number of items to uh, complete for the Littleton Downtown Development Authority following voter approval of that on November 8th, 2022. Um, what is exciting about this year is that now this becomes the annual cycle um, where the DDA presents their budget and their operating plan that matches that plan of development uh, that Planning Commission recommended approval to you on April 24th, as uh, City Attorney Reed Betzing shared, and then you approved on May 16th um, earlier this year. So what that did was allow for the tax increment financing, um, which is a major funding mechanism for the DDA to start to flow to the DDA. And uh, now as we look forward for that combination and the mill levy, uh, they have prepared a budget. And then again, uh, greater detail of the operating plan, which speaks directly to, I believe, those five elements of the, the plan of development. So it's broken down into those five sections. As you know, it's been in a fantastic partnership, and I think I would be remiss in not acknowledging your incredible support um, through the, the grant funding that was provided to the DDA, um, the leadership of Councilmember Pat Driscoll. It has been an incredible year of formation, and it is super exciting to be looking at a budget um, that starts to deliver on both the promise of the LDDA, but also uh, a number of those elements of the plan of development through the operations plan. So I'd like to turn it over to Jenny Starkey, Executive Director of Littleton Downtown Development Authority, and then I think you'll introduce your... Financial Advisor, Troy Berman. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Um, council members, Mayor, thank you for having us. Happy holidays and um, welcome, Council members uh, Peters and Reichert. It's exciting to work with you, and if you do have any questions in the future about the history of the DDA, I'd love to sit down with you um, and talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your support over the past year. It's been a wild ride. Um, and also thank you for uh, helping us reschedule due to some various health issues over the last month with toddlers that are petri dishes. So um, first I'd like to just say over the last year we have really focused on getting the LDDA off the ground. Um, there's five priority areas in the plan of development. The plan of development is the guiding light for the organization for the next 30 years. Um, we have some fantastic binders if you'd all like to have copies of those, we're happy to provide them. It's also available on our newly launched website. Um, but this 30-year guiding document is, is meant to be big. It is meant to be um, very, uh, it's visionary. It is meant to maybe even uh, cause a little bit of, you know, tingling because it's scary because it's a lot of work and that's what we're here to do that's why the voters approved us and that's what we're here to do for downtown littleton so in order to move a 30-year plan forward what we did was uh, develop a um, operating plan it's an annual operating plan and every year from here forward we will have an operating plan that supports the plan of development and moves us forward in sizable manageable, manageable chunks to get those 30-year goals uh, accomplished successfully so what we did was break that down the first operating plan you'll see uh, in your packets for 2023 and 2024 because the first two years are really where we're digging our, our um, or rolling up our sleeves. We're, we're getting the garden planted and we're, we're organizing what we need to do to get off the ground. Um, the operating plan, which moves the plan of development forward, then sets up our budget. We spent a lot of time this year trying to figure out what it would look like for the revenues to come in for the DDA so we had any idea of what we would be able to actually accomplish in 2024. 
in 2023, we had a lot of accomplishments just setting up the foundational elements of the district or of the authority to be able to operate. Um, now we have an understanding of what our revenue will look like in 2024. We have a budget that is very conservative um, on purpose, and but it will allow us to accomplish many things that are set out in the operating plan, which again supports the plan of development. Um, the DDA decided to uh, hire a financial advisor with Northland Securities Group, that is Troy Bernberg, who's sitting right next to me on my left. And Troy is helping provide financial oversight um, to the organization to get us going. And he has a specific skill set, which is why I did recommend to the board that we bring him on. So I'm going to introduce Troy and have him talk a little bit about where we are, how we got here, and uh, why we would love to see your support of our uh, budget. Good evening, Council. It's nice to be here with you and meet all of you tonight. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of working with the LDDA in an assistance advisory capacity um, as they get off the ground organizationally. As part of my larger public finance practice, I have developed somewhat of a specialty in early stage DDAs that was born out of some nonprofit uh, work, uh, volunteer work that I did years ago. And um, it's exciting um, to announce that D Littleton's DDA is the 20th DDA in the state of Colorado. It's also the third DDA most recently created in the last three years. So this is clearly a mechanism and an a economic development tool that communities are, are considering and using. Um, I'm assisting a, another community up in the mountains that's looking to form a DDA. So it's a very exciting tool. And as a participant in the broader URA DDA community, I want to thank the city for having the vision um, to create a DDA. And uh, thank you to the voters for approving uh, such creation. Um, again, it's a, it's a really important economic tool. And in the early years of a 30-year life cycle, financial support from a partnering municipality is crucially important. And so I want to thank the city for that investment because I believe it is immediately impactful and long-lasting excuse me, long lasting to the success of the DDA. <clears throat> Another thank you to voters for approving a mill levy authorization. Um, unlike uh, the two um, newest DDAs that preceded you, um, Littleton does have mill levy authorization. That's a great place to be because it provides a sustainable uh, revenue source for operations, something that not all DDAs have as a tool in their toolbox. So it really gets them off to the right start. It follows the momentum from your investment and continue, continues it sustainably. Um, tax increment um, will, uh, imp will prove to be a little more lumpy in that it's a little less consistent and more difficult to predict um, than mill levy authorization is. These revenues are, are a great deal more sensitive to external factors economically, legislatively, judicially, and that makes it very challenging to predict and project future increment. So in my mind, that warrants a very conservative budgeting approach. Um, budgeting, uh, projecting, and receiving tax increment, in my mind, uh, does require patience and flexibility. Um, Historically, by now, we will have, should have had our final assessments, uh, excuse me, our final valuations and mill levy certifications. Because of the special session, something itself we can't predict or anticipate, that special session put those dates out. So uh, oftentimes, we do have to be uh, flexible and nimble when it comes to uh, TIF and when it comes in and how much comes in versus how much we project it. Um, and so with that, our intent is to really project as conservatively as it is appropriate. And if it comes in differently than expected, then we'll be prepared to adjust as necessary. The DDA's plan of development, as we've discussed, along with its operational plan, and not all DDAs do operational plans, by the way. I think that's important context. And I think it's a great management and planning tool to affect a plan of development on a bite-sized basis. So I certainly applaud that practice. Um, and so the DDA's plan of development and the operational plan really dictate what uh, the budgeted expenditures are going to be for an organization like ours. Um, I'll say it again, having the resources at this point in the life cycle 
the city's investment, the mill levy authorization to sustain a management team is so incredibly important to the long-term <coughs> success of what a DDA does. So again, kudos to everyone for making sure that's in place. The rest of the programming uh, really represents continued investment in successes and initiatives that began this year and in the calendar year 23. Um, snow removal and cleaning are two examples of those successes that we'll continue to invest in. Uh, other areas are targeted for expansion and, and more investment. Um, I think it's important to remember that DDAs are meant to do stuff. They're meant to invest and spend money that they receive. And so um, there are other aspects like planning efforts and branding and marketing, among others. But there's also something that's not embedded in the, as a line item in the budget, and that's building and fostering strategic uh, collaborations and partnerships and relationships. Um, that's what any good um, and successful DDA does early, often, and throughout its life cycle. Um, these strategic partnerships are incredibly important on items like planning, joint planning efforts, joint grant match efforts. So these are important tools, and we feel that the budget uh, gets us to continue in the success of 2023. I'll end my comments with, um, we do have some leftover funds from calendar year 2023 that gives us a small cushion going into calendar year 2024. That's always a nice thing to have. Um, I think, again, in large part, DDAs are meant to invest and expend the dollars they want. So I'm okay with sometimes dipping into those cash on hand funds to um, accomplish our initiatives. Um, again, having the flexibility uh, with the mill levy authorization is a real luxury because it allows you to be a little more flexible with dipping into some of those cash on, uh, cash on hand funds. But ultimately, that's what a DDA has to balance. It has to balance operational and projects, success and sustainability with, uh, you know, setting aside enough money to accomplish projects on a yearly basis. Thank you for your support tonight. I think at this point, we'll go ahead and open it to any questions. Council, does anyone have any questions? Council Member Reichardt. So I'm thinking about the mix of the mill levy and the tax increment funding. And at this point, first, a stupid question. Are both of those um, kind of um, is, um, forever? Do we have a limit on how long those were authorized? Um, yes, the initial life cycle of a DDA is 30 years. Um, the legislature um, this year did extend abilities for DDAs to extend their life cycle longer. Um, initially, you have a 30-year cycle, then you have another 20-year. This year's legislation allows them to continue to roll over um, that life cycle, um, but typically it's 30 years to expend and collect tax increment dollars, as well as the mill levy authorization. So the TIF funding will grow over time. Is, that, is, is, is there any time where, um, and is it, is, is, are we able to at some point, if we want to, to forego the mill levy because the TIF funding has met the needs of the DDA? Um, I certainly think that would be a great place to be. Because I'm confident we're gonna be successful in raising the value of the- That's property. what I wanna hear, and I think you've got a great board that's also dedicated to the same on the LDDA. So they're hungry to do a lot more, and yeah, uh, we should have our eyes be really big and our stomachs be equally as big. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions? I just have one question for, probably for Director Starkey. With the, on the budget, you know, the, uh, the three different revenue sources there, um, Looking at the expenses, I see events. There's twenty-five thousand dollars budgeted for uh, for events. Does that uh, include? Is that net or gross? Um, I, I'm assuming the events would bring in some revenue. Is that twenty-five thousand dollars with that kind of offset of that revenue source from those those events? Yeah, that's a great question, Mayor Slater. Thank you. Um, right now, what the events bucket really uh, suggests is support, marketing, promotion. Um, whether or not the DDA becomes a full-blown event production company is up for discussion with the board. Um, but right now, the events really is to support anything that meets the mission and the vision of the DDA. So, for example, we were able to um, give a grant of $5,000 to the historic 
um, Downtown Littleton Merchants Association in support of their efforts to um, create a more vibrant uh, main street during the holidays um, due to the loss of the trees and the lights. So that was something that fit our mission and our vision and the board voted to support. So that, that $25,000 bucket really is more of um, funding to support efforts around the community. Eventually as that grows, we will look at larger events that um, are meant to increase pedestrian foot traffic and vibrancy in the district and would eventually bring in um, money. So there's no current plans for revenue generating? No generation. current okay. plans. Okay, great, that's all. Uh, Council Member Wrighton. Yes, hi, thank you for being here tonight. I saw one of the line items in the budget is for public art. Um, do you already have a partner in mind for that? At this point, we do not. However, there have been a lot of discussions about potential um, partnerships with different arts and cultures organizations, but none have been named at this time. Well, the Littleton Arts uh, and Culture Commission would love to be a partner. So. We're happy to hear that. Thank you. Councilmember Peters. Since she brought up the beautiful and welcoming section, can I ask about the flowers? Because that, as a master gardener, that seems a little bit steep for flowers, but I'm also curious if they're perennials and annuals. I know it's highly specific, but. I love that. I love to know you're a master gardener. Um, so that, that one is to really look at the district as a whole and what it takes to create more vibrant and beautiful environment for pedestrians and businesses. Um, looking at hanging flower pots, looking at planter garden beds, looking at support of small businesses that might need some funds granted to also enhance their uh, storefront to do the same, um, and also then the care and maintenance of those. It would also potentially look at what it takes to do um, zero escaping efforts to conserve water efforts and partnership with the city to maintain um, a more vibrant Bega Park as well, which is in the district, um, and enhance some of that landscaping. So no promises, but um, I hate to say that we need you know studies to do any of this, but we want to be smart with the money and make sure that whatever we are placing outside is supported with public works efforts and the DDA's maintenance. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, just a real quick comment. Um, I think the budget, everything, the activities you have listed out look great. Um, walking through your work plan seems, you know, the activities you've listed seem great. Um, I think one thing that would actually help us as a council in the future kind of get a better comprehension of city in-kind contributions to think activities that are happening downtown is to be able to break out even approximations of that in the budget. So for example, where you call out closer coordination with Littleton Police Department in terms of security, like anticipations of cost, time, level of effort as to what would be an expected contribution of the city towards those efforts. Again, not necessarily as a line item coming out of your budget, but helps us kind of get an understanding of like what the monetary nature of the relationship continues to be. So not a problem for this budget. Obviously this is very early days, but in the future, I think that would be really helpful for council. I think it's a great suggestion. And um, as a, a friendly reminder that every year we will be um, engaging in an, um, an IGA with the city that will help us make sure that all of that is explained in detail. But thank you very much for that. Yeah, and, and I'll just add from the staff perspective, Director Starkey and, and I are very focused on making sure that we can get that um, IGA to a place where you can really see that partnership laid out very, very specifically. And we have a clear understanding of roles and responsibilities, particularly as we wrap up the planning phase of Project Downtown, move into design and future investments in downtown. We'll really want to be clear about um, when that investment is made, is there a shared role in maintenance or, you know, if we put a uh, some of that infrastructure in place, then if the flowers are coming from the DDA, that we have a clear document that speaks to that. Councilman Reichart. I feel like I got ahead of myself with my um, TIF question. And I want to circle back and thank you to Council or Mayor Pro Temp Barr for, you know, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate this. I, I, I also found the op operating plan easy to go through and I understand that I appreciate you making the connections to the different um, kind of goals. Um, and I, I really appreciate it. It looked good to me. I had a really minor question, and this is not a gotcha, but the the, um, the budget for the admin assistant um, 
I'm hoping that they are part-time because it's not a livable wage if that's full-time. Our admin assistant is part-time. Actually, probably only five to 10 hours a week. So thank Great. you for that. She'd be thrilled to hear that support. <laughs> Any other questions? See nothing. Uh, is there a motion? Yeah, I'll make the motion, uh, Mayor. I uh, move to approve resolution uh, uh, 113 2023, approving the 2024 operating plan and budget for Littleton Downtown Development Authority. I'll second. I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 113. Any further discussion or comments, Council? Seeing none, I'm going to open. The voting slowly should be open now the vote is seven in favor the motion carries unanimously thank you thank you thank happy you. holidays thank you all right moving on to item 10 ordinances on second reading and public hearings we have three ordinances on second reading tonight with uh, public hearings uh, first one is Ordinance 21-2023, an ordinance on second reading approving a local historic landmark designation for the Knight residence located at 5870 South Curtis Street. Uh, we will have a uh, presentation by staff, and I will just um, note to council that this is a uh, quasi-judicial hearing, which means that we are... Uh, looking, acting as judges, looking at this based on the record presented to us tonight and um, submitted to us in our packet. Uh, we haven't had outside conversations uh, with people, as would be uh, biased as, as judge, and that when we get through to our uh, comments and discussions that we um, talk about the criteria, that we have very specific criteria that we can um, make this decision on, so not other things outside that criteria. So just as we get through that, make sure you lay out your your decision based on those criteria that are in uh, code. And so on that, I will turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item comes to you following a recommendation and uh, approval from your um, historic preservation board, sorry, for the, uh, the, at their hearing, which was held on September 18th. Um, the board, as I said, recommended uh, um, approval. The criteria of which the mayor spoke is uh, contained in your uh, in the uh, staff communication. Now I'm going to turn it over now to our senior planner, Terry Whitmore, for a, a little more context and process and uh, criteria information. Terry, welcome. Thank you, Mr. City Manager, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, and members of council. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today and give a little overview of the Knight House, which is at 5870 uh, South Curtis Street's beautiful home. I've had the opportunity to be there for uh, the public hearing. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation, uh, but would also like to just start by thanking uh, Mr. John Gherkin, who is here today, uh, he actually owns this property. He's the one that submitted it for consideration for the local historic designation. And uh, they've done a wonderful job. Um, and my job today is to uh, not only share the information that uh, both our Historic Preservation Board here at the City of Littleton and Mr. Gherkin have provided, um, but also to talk a bit about, as the mayor had outlined, the uh, criteria and how this particular case does meet that local designation uh, criteria threshold. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start with the presentation and look forward to your questions uh, at the end. Okay, so the purpose of today's meeting is to talk a bit about uh, the Knight House at 5870 South Curtis. It is indicative of uh, what is called the, I like to always make sure I have it cor correct, the Railtown Physical Form, which is a uh, architectural style from uh, City of Littleton had uh, quite a bit of back from 1870 to 1920 with its proximity to uh, rail and, uh, you know, the need for housing for uh, people here in the community. 
you'll see that with the historic picture to the right, um, my right, and uh, the picture to the left of how, how much uh, care has been put into preserving this home, uh, both exterior and then I'll show you some pictures to the interior as well. In terms of overview, uh, it was constructed, we're not certain of the exact date, but uh, late 1890s to the early 1900s. Um, it's very indicative of early uh, residential character, city of Littleton. Uh, and another key piece of this case is it's got a, a historic significant connection to Sonia Ellenbo. Uh, we'll talk a bit about what uh, she has done for the city of Littleton and the community as a whole. Um, in addition, there is uh, some um, architectural uh, adjustments that have been made to the rear. Th those aren't necessarily historically significant, but when I show you those, it's not significant in terms of the architecture, but it is in terms of the um, local history and how Sonia Ellingbo is connected to the community and, uh, you know, and, and basically uh, the types of businesses that were able to operate out of the rear of this property. And then also um, the original owner, why it's called the Knight House, um, Harold Knight, uh, was a volunteer firefighter in the community and was also a sexton of the Littleton Cemetery and spent a lot of volunteer hours at the cemetery. So here's um, some more images. Mr. Uh, Gherkin was kind enough to provide uh, for this presentation. Uh, he was able to get a hold of these for the history of his home. Um, and uh, basically it shows uh, James and Eleanor Knight in front of their home. Um, and then also the note on the back of this particular picture shows that um, it was between 1895 and 1900. Um, I mentioned a bit about the rear of the property and uh, that addition. Um, what's significant about the addition is that this served um, as a bookstore for the city of Littleton, and it was uh, called the Book House. And there's also a side uh, door that uh, was part of that entrance to the Book House that's been preserved by the owner. Uh, so. Even though it may not look architecturally significant, uh, that piece of the home has actually been preserved. And then also there's a lot of work that has been done in the interior to really bring together the old portion and the new portion in a very seamless manner. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Sonia Ellingbo, who she was. Uh, she managed the book house bookstore at this location. Um, and so this is one key piece that does meet one of the criteria that we'll be talking about today, which is our Unified Land Use Code Section 10-9-8.4, um, basically stating it has value as a building that is characteristic of the city's earliest residential character, and it's also associated with a historical figure and also um, the history of the community. So she's a key piece of why this building is coming before you today. Um, also, Ms. Ellingbo was uh, featured in a 2015 article honoring her years of service to Colorado Community Media. That's the second picture that you have in front of you. Um, there were many articles where she is uh, highlighted. So she's a, a real asset in our history here in Littleton. And just to give a quick overview, she moved here in 1956. She purchased her home in Aberdeen Village um, when the streets were still unpaved. Frequent visitor to the Littleton Arts Museum um, as a supporter uh, in many ways. Uh, the book house wasn't just a fly-by-night type of operation. It opened up in 1970 and closed in 1986. And that was where it was operated, it was in that back edition. Uh, the Healy family, which are the owners of the Littleton Times, uh, mentioned that she also provided them office space in that back portion of uh, the Curtis Street property in the bookstore area. So it's also served as a business location in support of media here in the community. And uh, the Littleton Times later combined uh, to be part of the Littleton Independent. 
And as I had mentioned, uh, Ms. Ellingbo is very involved in various leadership and community service opportunities and uh, contributions here in the community. So here's just a few more pictures of the love and care that was put into the preservation of this home uh, from the, uh, the lead door uh, that uh, actually I had the opportunity to try and open and shut it. It's very heavy. It's, you know, you can tell it's, it's very solid uh, historical piece of this home um, and how like the areas of the foyer, uh, the connections to the different rooms, the, the wood features, everything has been uh, painstakingly preserved on this property. And to talk a little bit about the landmark designation criteria, um, the ones I'm focusing on in the presentation are the ones that have the strongest connection to this request, not all of the approval criteria in the ULUC are essential for local designation. There are different criteria if the actual owner requests consideration of their home than if we were doing a uh, entire uh, neighborhood um, designation um, or something that was brought forward um, without the owners being the applicant. So just to kind of give that overview, and, but I'm more than uh, able to talk of each of the criteria if you have questions uh, later on. Uh, but the ones I wanted to focus on uh, in 10-8, 3.2 are um, one, the age of the home. Uh, it is over 100 years, uh, meets the significance with the historical architectural character with the, um, how they word it is the rail town, I wanna make sure I do this right, rail town physical form from 1870 to 1920. Um, it also has integrity um, from, it's preservation of its uh, historic features, uh, trying to preserve as much of the physical form as it was able to, but also that significant person connection, the community connection with the business uh, operation out of the site, and then also with a significant person here in the Littleton community with Sonia Ellingbow and her contributions to media in Littleton, uh, specifically to the Littleton Independent. Uh, all the public notification processes were followed uh, for this meeting today. Uh, property owners and residents within 700 uh, square feet of the, uh, or 700 feet, excuse me, of the property, it's uh, surrounding the property, were notified. In fact, we go a little bit over 700 feet to make certain that we have met that standard. First neighborhood meeting in September of uh, 13th of, of 2023, we had two residents that attended. Their main questions were related to how the uh, historic designation of this property might affect their property. And that is, it does not affect any other properties on the Curtis Street or the surrounding area. This only impacts the particular property at 5870 South Curtis. Once those neighbors were um, provided that information. Uh, the second neighborhood meeting that was held um, October 25th, 2023 had no attendees. So all questions had been answered and there was no concern raised. Uh, property was posted as required with sign for the public uh, hearing and uh, the neighborhood meetings uh, were also um, outlined on the city's website uh, per our requirements and advertised in the newspaper. Staff recommendation uh, that all applicable criteria for landmark designation at a local level have been met. Uh, staff recommends approval. Also in support of the Historic Preservation Board Resolution 08-2023. Uh, the site's eligible. Uh, value for cultural heritage for the city. Property is associated with Harold Knight and Sonia Elimbo. Uh, displays characteristics of architectural styles as mentioned and uh, other review criteria that it uh, wasn't as strongly associated with um, are, that are not applicable, aren't a consideration for a resident that requests their own home at a local designation. Um, and with that, I'll answer any questions. And also Mr. Gherkins here if uh, you would like to ask him any questions and I know he'd love to speak with you. It's okay with council. I'm gonna. There's two people signed up for the public comment portion. One is the applicant, so that might answer some questions that if you had. So I'll start with them and have them come up. Um, so I'm gonna open the public comment period at 7:34. Um, invite Mr. Uh, Josh Gerken up. Thank you, sir. 
think you said John, right? Uh, uh, yes, John, sorry. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I just want to give you this. Terry did a great job of explaining the property and everything. I'll give you a little personal side of how Liz, uh, my wife who has passed in, in 2020, but uh, Liz and I uh, were always interested in historic preservation. Uh, we've been on the historic Littleton board, not the preservation board, but the historic Littleton board for, I don't know, 20 years or so. And um, from the get-go, uh, when we got involved with the Sonia's house, we were going to designate it as a historic uh, house. Um, we um, were a step family. We lived in Highland Ranch in a McMansion with five kids of step family, and um, they matriculated out. And uh, I always remember uh, Liz was an interior designer, and she had a lot of subs. And one of her sub painters says, "You know, like." What are you living in this 5,000 square house? You need to move down to your office. So we uh, took the property of 5870, which wasn't suitable as a resident. There wasn't a kitchen. There wasn't a suitable bathroom. There wasn't a laundry room, whatever. But we kept the historic guts of the interior and um, totally rewired it, replumbed it, re uh, work walls and everything and um, we had a great uh, finished carpenter that replicated all the old woodwork and all well, in the new work that we were using so uh, anyway it we just had a um, and and when we moved down there it was like 18 years ago and uh, the redevelopment in Littleton was, hadn't started yet the Main Street was uh, Jose's, the Oasis, the Jet Bar, and OTT, Old Town Tavern. That was it. And uh, But then when re developers started finding Littleton, we saw all the scraping off and everything, and, and that just committed us to uh, make our home as an example of what Littleton was like in the 1890s. Um, a little aside, last summer, I uh, witnessed the uh, destruction of two homes on Rapp Street that were scraped, but actually they were chewed. It was like a T-Rex came in and just chewed these things down. I was watching there, and then I was visualizing my home that it, we re did the whole thing, and if that would happen to it, would be a, a crime. But uh, anyway, that's uh, the reason we want to uh, preserve this home for the history of. Thank Bolton. you. So, if you could stay nearby, I don't know if anyone would have questions for you. But uh, sure. Thanks. Uh, other person signed up is Pam Chadbourne. I'm Pam Chadbourne, I live downtown, and I want to thank Mr. Gergen for um, his work on this home, he and his wife's work on this home, and for uh, putting it forward for historic designation. This is a great action by a citizen, and it, um, I am grateful. Uh, the city should be grateful, and it's great. I also want to mention that I think Liz is Liz Eden, and I, the guy encountered Liz Eaton as a member of Historic Littleton Inc. That's a citizen advocacy group for historic preservation. And she was actually very knowledgeable and very able and willing to help other people understand historic preservation. And I'm sorry that we've lost her. She was a great contributor to Littleton herself. Um, Sonia Ellingbow obviously is a contributor to Littleton. It wasn't just that she had articles about her in the Littleton Independent. She had a regular column in the Littleton Independent for decades. And so um, that contribution alone uh, is extraordinary and uh, shows her value to the historic fabric of our community. Um, the criteria, I think that it meets 
the minimum number of needed criteria. Um, however, the one thing I wanted to um, talk about is the integrity of the location. And as mentioned, that neighborhood is being, not crumbling, being destroyed rapidly by redevelopment. Our poor fit new land use code allows that. And a couple of weeks ago, December 7th, there was a neighborhood meeting about a house two blocks down, beautiful two-story um, pitched roof, uh, raised a family of five. I went to school with the um, high school with one of those kids. And the neighborhood meeting was to demolish it and replace it with a three-story, what I call, front-range mediocre. And that's terrible. And it, I think the integrity of this home is strengthened by making, expanding our downtown historic district. And there are many eligible uh, structures that have the, the uh, criteria, meet them well. City Council needs to reconsider its position on Geneva Village. That was wrong. And expanding the historic district to the football or the diamond, whatever you want to call it, would strengthen uh, the power of all of these potential remaining buildings, which are vanishing rapidly, as Mr. Gerken pointed out, it would expand their possibility to strengthen our future, our city's future, as a historic district. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. That's all we have signed up. Is there anybody else that would like to speak um, specifically to this issue? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public comment period at 7.41 and see if Council has any clarifying questions uh, before we get into any discussion or comments. Uh, we need to do that after a motion, but any questions? Councilman Reichert? Um, uh, this is a question, I think, for the attorney on the criteria that we can use. Um, you, you sent uh, me an email and, uh, around the kind of A through H criteria that we can use for this, um, for our determination. And can, then, can I interrupt you for a second? And just, I'm going to read those criteria just so everyone watching knows what they are. Is that okay with I'm, you? Or, I can, yes, or do you yeah. want to read, read them? You have a better voice than me. <laughs> I don't know about that. but um, So the criteria for a consensual designation are, um, it has A, has value as a reminder of the cultural and archaeological heritage of the nation, state, or city. B, the location is a site of significant national, state, or local event. C, it identifies with a person or persons who significantly contributed to the development of the nation, state, or city. D, it identifies with the work of a master builder, designer, or architect whose individual work has influenced the development of the nation, state, or city. E, it has value as a building that is recognized for the quality of its architecture and that it retains sufficient elements showing architectural significance. F, it displays characteristics of an architectural style of a period. G, it has a character as a geographical definable area possessing a significant concentration of sites, buildings, objects, structures uh, united by architectural style, by plan or physical development. And, and it ha H, it has character as an established and geographically definable neighborhood united by culture or past events. And I would assume those last two are more for the districts rather than individual. So continue. Yes, yeah, so I was trying to understand the relationship for those criteria that that we are supposed to use in the designation, but then, I'm sorry, the staff uh, talked about integrity and that being one of the criteria that was used in their recommendation. And I just, I don't, I need to understand the relationship between the criteria we're using and the, and the integrity criteria that were used by staff. So the distinction between eligibility criteria and then approval criteria. Okay, Is that, thank you. That's, thank you, city attorney, Blanker. was he right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, when, when evaluating an application that comes in, that's something that uh, community development staff takes a look at as well as the HPB, HPB board on, as um, if it will be eligible for designation. Thank you very much for helping me with that. Any other questions? Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, just one quick question. Uh, many of those criteria relate to the architectural styling, and it wasn't necessarily clear in the first read that the architectural styling displayed characteristics of any particular period or particular style. Now, I know there is no uh, master architect um, that was overseeing its development, but you referred to rail, rail town physical form 
as being that uh, significant architectural style. Can you just tell us a little bit, you know, do we have an approximate number of other residential units throughout the city, the area that also display these characteristics? I, I guess I'm trying to uh, quantify significance in terms of its architectural styling. I do not have a overview of how many other properties, unfortunately, within Littleton have that particular architectural style. Um, but it does, uh, all the properties with historic significance within the city of Littleton have the, uh, basically what they call from the Colorado Historical Society, the historic building inventory record that's been put together and it's been specifically outlined that that is the style of this property. And uh, each property within Littleton would have a card like this with their style that has been designated. So it's something that we could develop a record of. We are fortunate to have a new historic preservation planner that will be starting at the beginning of February. And I know that this is going to be a high priority. And so I think we will start to have a lot more resource and information for you going forward. But I don't have that information right now. Councilmember Peters? Um, I feel unclear on a few things. Um, is there anywhere that explains what significant means? Is that subjective? We don't have a provision within the ULUC that would guide someone in terms of how one evaluates what is significant and what is not. So in essence, it is relatively subjective. And then my other question is, the way that this is written, it looks to me like semicolon, 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 and how many of these criteria does it need to meet? That structure makes it look like it needs to meet all of them. I would say normally from a legal construction standpoint, when you have, yeah, colon, semicolon, semicolon, and it generally needs to meet all of those criteria, but from a practicality or practicability standpoint, um, if one were to apply all eight of those criteria to a project or a property within the city, there would be nothing ever designated. It would be, I wouldn't say impossible, but almost impossible to satisfy all eight criteria on one specific property. So um, I believe the uh, staff has uh, tackled this appropriately by taking a look at those particular uh, criteria that would be applicable to a to a single standalone property and not a district or anything like that. Is that something we can clarify as we adjust the ULUC? So we know how many criteria we need to meet? So if that is council's prerogative to take a look at the criteria, both in terms of applicability as well as the criteria for designating this, that's something that certainly we can uh, explore going through uh, ULUC future iterations. Um, typically, if there are changes to be made to a criteria, how we would go about doing that is uh, we would have presumably a study session with our historic planning board, um, go through um, you know, kind of a brainstorming session as to uh, if anything's missing, have that same sort of conversation with city council and recommend revisions, which we would take to HPB for a recommendation. And then if there are a recommendation to changes, bring those forward to city council for your consideration on public hearing. In short, yes. I will uh, second her comments on that. I think that I would like to see that. I think the, the criteria in the description is, is vague and not clear and could, could use improvement. But that doesn't necessarily pertain to our decision tonight. Um, but in the future, I think that would be something that we could um, move forward with. Uh, council Member Reichert. Well, ju just to clarify, it, are we being asked to decide whether it meets enough of those criteria adequately to reach the threshold of designation? Is that the determination that we're being asked to make? Correct. And I would say we'll call it criteria because that's how it's listed. But, you know, I think it, perhaps it's helpful to consider them as considerations. Um, so there's a list of eight considerations for you to weigh in on. And while they are somewhat subjective, so a particular council member could put more weight into one rather than another, and that would be kind of a turning point for that individual council person. Yeah, go ahead. So the decision, 
obviously I, it, um, it can meet one of their criteria or more of their criteria, but we still could decide that it hasn't adequately met all of the criteria for designation. Is, is that, I'm just trying to make sure I'm, I'm understanding the decision that I'm being asked to make here correctly. Uh, if you were to find one of these criteria that's applicable to the designation of an historic landmark, i.e. this particular property that's not being met, then yes, the fact that it met some of these and not one that's applicable, you could certainly vote no. Yeah, and obviously, there's a couple of them that are about districts and would be completely yeah, unfair I would to say hold probably it to that criteria. The last two that reference geographically definable yeah. area, as well as uh, they both reference geographical definable neighborhoods and, and area. Those are probably more akin to, and it is one of the criteria if you're doing an, an historic district. So we're trying to kind of cobble together, if you will, criteria or considerations that would apply to both a district as well as a single property, as is the case right now. I have one more question for staff, but we, I can wait. If... No, go, go ahead. So can you talk to me about the eligibility criteria, how you thought about the building form, site location, um, and historic features, yeah, and how you made that assessment that it met that eligibility criteria? I feel like the, um, the owner has made the point that the site location and the, and the neighborhood is, is changing. And so given the fact that the neighborhood is changing, how is this site location within that neighborhood, how did it meet the eligibility criteria in your mind? Or maybe that's not what you took into to account. Well, sig there are a number of questions that have been asked um, on this particular project. So, you know, there, you're thinking through all the different criteria, the information that we have available on the property. Um, it has a varied background um, that has uh, the historic character of the original home and then the, um, you know, the business and community leader aspect to it. Um, that really this area of Curtis, Rapp, you know, the area we're talking about where you do have some of these beautiful historic resources that in some cases are in different levels of um, repair currently. Some have been really well preserved, some are, have not. Um, but it's an anchor to our areas that are redeveloping of the downtown. It's part of what develops that character of uh, the community. Uh, when people come into town, they go through our, our you know, neighborhoods in addition to our, um, you know, our, uh, our Main Street area. That's one of the reasons why the Unified Land Use Code has that transitional area. And we have standards that extend beyond the Main Street area because those areas that surround Main Street are also critical to enhancing and preserving uh, that character of Littleton. So that is part of that process and that analysis that I went through as I started to look at what information I had on the property and how to make the, the best case to move forward to you as a body today. Any other questions? All right, well, no questions. Is there a motion? Then we continue to have discussion and ask questions more if you want, but. Yes, I'm just getting there. <laughs> Who's gonna win? <laughs> yes, I move to approve ordinance 21-2023. In ordinance on second reading, approving local historic uh, landmark designation for the Knight residence located at 5870 South Curtis Street. Second. We have a motion and a second by Council Member Grove. Um, any further discussion? Council Member Driscoll? Am I able to make a comment? Yes. Okay, I didn't want uh, quasi-judicial. Uh, you know, I've, I've been to this uh, uh, home before and uh, a couple of the other homes uh, next to it. And um, I, I think uh, the historic di uh, district or historic uh, committee did a great job of uh, presenting why this building should be saved or, or not just saved, but uh, put in the historic uh, designation. So, um, you know, by my count, I had five, uh, uh, five of uh, the eight characteristics met, and uh, so to me, that's, that's good enough. Councilman Wright, did you have comments? Uh, just that I'll, I'll be in supportive of it. I think it meets the criteria, in my opinion. Anybody else? Councilman Record. Well, I really appreciate your uh, Opening up this discussion, uh, Mayor Schlachter, around whether our criteria 
um, meet the um, the uh, goals of this part of the the code. I'm not confident that our current criteria for determining eligibility meet the purpose of, of uh, that is outlined in um, in I guess it's Article 10 of our of our code or Chapter 8 I guess of our code. I, I feel like there's a real disconnect there, and um, I hope that we can look at that in the future. Um, I'm, I, um, I think it's really valuable and important to honor um, when an, an owner of a property asks for their property be, to be designated a historic um, designation. I think that's really important. Um, I'm not at all confident um, that it meets how I would think about the eligibility in terms of site location. It feels like it's out of character with the future of that neighborhood. Um, and I'm not at all confident uh, I feel really torn about the fact that the majority of this house is actually not a historic structure. Um, it's, a, it's the addition that was built on later. And so, the, and so for that criteria that we have, um, that it dis, I think that it displays the characteristics of an architectural style or a period, um, I feel like it's, it's challenging to say that it met that criteria. Um, but I, so I'm really uh, torn about this decision. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with it because uh, I'm not confident it, um, uh, it meets the criteria that we have in front of us. Councilmember Grove. Um, thank you, John, and uh, what your wife did. I worked with Liz on HLI, and she was a delight. Uh, I really appreciate what you've done. I support the criteria that staff has uh, selected. It doesn't bother me so much that the back has been changed because from the front you can't see it and it doesn't affect the overall look and feel or the integrity of the house in terms of changing the front. So I would support the designation. Mayor Potem? Yeah, um, just walking through the criteria, um, you know, I, I appreciate the work that staff has put into this. Um, you know, obviously you did your, your research and, and I appreciate the property owner putting it forward. I, I too, uh, council member record did struggle with, um, how it met some of these criteria and quite honestly, the word significance is thrown around a lot in, in these, um, evaluations and that is quite subjective. Um, and both in significance of the individual, that we are identifying as having significant importance to our city, but also in significance of its character and styling. So it does display characteristics of an architectural style period that you, you presented um, and you confirmed that. Um, there is no specific quality of the master architecture component of that criteria. Um, designer, the location is a site of significant national uh, event, obviously doesn't meet that not counting the ones uh, meant to represent a district, which are the last two criteria, um, and has a value as a reminder. Um, you know, I, again, it's, it's pretty loose, quite honestly. Like, it, it definitely falls into a gray area. Um, and like I said, I don't want to kind of impugn someone's memory by saying that their contributions to a city were not significant. We just, I feel like, need to clarify um, significance and that quality um, further. I am not sure how I'm going to vote on it. I'm truly on the fence. This is a tough call. I think it meets maybe half um, if I squint and look sideways. Councilmember Peters? Um, I'm also torn. I feel like the criteria is not clear and maybe that my, what I need to have clarified is with the way it's written. Um, I think there's about three criteria that it doesn't meet and two that don't apply. I'm torn because I think it has been recommended that we approve it, and so I think I approve it, but it is difficult for me and it is unclear. Um, well, for me, look, going through the, the uh, criteria, I think the, the four criteria that staff said that it meets, I, I think it meets it tenuously on some of these. I think this is a very, uh, uh, hard case here because you know it, it does have value as a reminder of our cultural heritage. I, I, I suppose you know when a changing downtown and an old residential building has has some value. Um, the I, I agree with uh, Councilmember Barr or uh, Mayor Pro Tem Barr about the um, 
the um, identifying with a person that's significantly contributed to it. And, you know, I know it's it's interesting because it's the the night residents, but that's not who is the significant contributor. Um, so it's uh, someone else. So I, I'm I'm struggling to 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 see that next necessarily connection there. Um, and I, I'm not sure that it is, uh, has the value as a building is recognized for its quality of its architecture. I'm, you know, I mean, it's, it has, it retains elements of an architectural style, but I don't know if it, what the quality is. Um, however, I um, do think that, uh, especially in light of a changing area, uh, that reminder of a cultural value, um, you know, I, I would rather err on uh, the side of preserving something um, rather than um, taking it away because you're not going to get it back. Um, and I have a question for uh, the city attorney, and I know they answered it in, in email, but I just want to say, is, is there a process you know, um, for removing a histor historic designation in the future if for some reason something changes and um, it, it needs to be removed Um, yes, there is a process for <laughs> removal that is typically done by uh, the property owner at that time and grounds, therefore, generally if uh, the upkeep hasn't kept up and it no longer has kind of that character that was one of the bases for um, designating it. So there is a process. Um, it's not a process necessarily that city council could bring on their own. Um, so whoever the future property owner would be would have to bring that to uh, HPP for their consideration on removal. Okay, thanks. So um, I will be voting for the designation, but I do think this is you know not one of those clear cut things that they, uh, this is was something we clearly need to uh, preserve here in the city. Um, but um, I, do, I think it barely meets the um, criteria. Anyone else have anything else to add before I open the voting? Okay. All right. I am going to open the voting. City Clerk. The vote is five in favor with council members Reichardt and Bard voting no. The motion carries. City manager, you're looking at me. Mayor, just want to check, I think, head nods for uh, direction to your uh, HPB to do some work to clarify the uh, ULUC with regard to the significance criteria, way it's written, what those points are. Uh, that could be considered as part of the other U of the other U U uh, UIUC amendments later this year. Just checking for council's direction. <laughs> yes. Go, well, yeah, go ahead, Robert. <laughs> Thank you very much. I I, I agree with uh, what you said. I I would really like some connection to the um, to the pur purpose and app. Applicability of this whole section within the code. Um, there's there's eight elements in there that I think are really valuable, but I'm not seeing um, connections with all of those in in our current criteria. And and so I would like to have those clearer lines drawn. Is, is that okay, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you so much for that, Council. Um, we have uh, moving on in the agenda. If I can get to it. Mayor, can we take a short recess? Can we get through this item here and then take a break before the next one where there's two? Or do we need, you want to do it right now? I'm right there with you. All right, um, item B, uh, ordinance 37, uh, 2023, an ordinance on second reading establishing the requirements of the handling of domestic violence cases in Littleton's municipal court. So I'm gonna turn this over to the city attorney. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to everyone for showing up for this item. Um, so this is a domestic violence ordinance, and uh, the purpose of this is back in May, May 25th, 2023, House Bill uh, 232222 uh, was established by, was passed by uh, the state. And what it did is it 
um, made certain requirements for municipalities that handled domestic violence related offenses. Now I will tell you that there are currently, I think only six cities within Colorado that still do their own domestic violence related offenses. Most of those go to county. Um, some of those jurisdictions that still do them are pretty significant in terms of size, in terms of um, volume of cases. So the city of Denver uh, is one, Aurora being another. Um, I believe Arvada and Lakewood still do them as well. Uh, when House Bill 2322 20, 20, came out, really the basis for it um, was that there were a lot of different jurisdictions ar around the state that were handling domestic violence related offenses differently. And by handling them, I mean the sentences were kind of all over the board. A lot of them were not having uh, protection orders in place. A lot of them were not ha were having differing bond requirements. Some of the convictions were not being reported to NCIC, which is, or CCIC in our case, which would be um, the Colorado, uh, basically the, it keeps track of um, criminal violations within our state. And so if this, if someone had uh, received a domestic violence uh, offense and was convicted of it in, in one city, sometimes it wasn't showing up. So if you looked at uh, their CCIC report, their rap sheet, if you will, uh, criminal history, you wouldn't actually see it. So there was some attempt to standardize it. Uh, to be honest, they wanted to get rid of it entirely so that municipalities couldn't handle domestic violence related offenses, but some of the larger jurisdictions spoke up. So the city of Littleton is one of the cities that has historically handled domestic violence related cases. I will tell you, over the last several years, we have not. A decision was made several years ago to file those cases that could otherwise have been filed within our municipal court, of which we did, you know, hundreds in a year, up to county court. And that was a decision that was based primarily on resources and a decision that the state or the county had a lot more resources in place to handle those types of offenses. From support to victims in those types of cases, as well as more consistent um, probation type requirements and support for offenders. Um, the ability to have pre-sentence investigations um, prior to sentencing, more hands-on kind of support for those types of offenses. Um, so we've been going down that path for several years. And if this is really an option. So what this does is not work. But if it did work, what you would see is that what the domestic violence, oh, look how nice. Uh, one more, please. I'll, I'll drive. You drive. There's only 40 slides, so it's okay. We're, we're halfway there. Um, what, what this ordinance does, it basically um, puts the city in compliance with what the state law says. And the state law says, look, you have to comply with the Victims' Rights Act. That was something that we always did. And basically what the Victims' Rights Act is, is it's a lot of notification requirements for victims in cases that they're, for certain types of offenses, they have a right to be informed as to what's happening with that case. Um, so we would always contact victims and let them know the status of cases going through our system. Um, certain bonding requirements that they want to consistent with state laws, as well as sentencing guidelines that were consistent with state law. This isn't really a problem that Littleton had in the past, but this is what uh, the state found other jurisdictions were not consistent with. So those are technically things that we would have already have done, but in order to be in compliance with this House bill, we need to update our code to say that we're gonna do these things. Now, right now, I don't believe that's going to change anything in terms of where we are filing these cases. We are still planning on filing them in county court where there are more resources for both victims as well as defendants. However, it provides us an option in the future. So if for some reason some sort of funding changes, there's more resources available to municipalities, we could then start filing them back into the municipal court where we certainly have a probation officer there who's very capable, we have a prosecutor who's very capable, as well as a judge who's very capable of handling these cases. Um, so really this is just to uh, bring us into compliance with state law if in the future our direction changes. And I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Any questions, Council? No questions? All right, as this is a ordinance on second reading, I'm gonna open a public hearing at 8.09. There is no one signed up to speak about this. Anybody wish to speak about it? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close public comment at 8.09 and see if uh, there's a motion. Mayor, I move to approve ordinance 37-2023, an ordinance on second reading and establishing requirements for the handling of domestic violence cases in Littleton's Municipal Court. I'll second. I have a motion and a second by Council Member Ryden. Uh, Council, any comments, discussion? I'll just say as this is a basically just changing our code to allow us to do this in the future if we wanted to, to be in compliance with state law, not uh, changing policy of where these cases are filed right now. I think this is uh, in the best interest of the city, so I'll be definitely supporting this. Anyone else? Voting is opening. There we go. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Great, thanks. At this point, um, we have two agenda items left here. There will be one presentation. Um, we'll um, consider the resolution ordinance separately. But before we get to that, we're gonna take a uh, short recess. And so let's plan on uh, getting back here at, uh, is four minutes enough? 8.15?
All right, we are reconvened. Uh, we have uh, two more items on the agenda. Uh, we will have both the item C and item D, uh, resolution 119, resolution approving an amendment to the future land use and character map for a portion of 700 West Mineral Avenue from a business a suburban business park to suburban residential multifamily and ordinance 40 2023 and ordinance on second reading approving a rezoning of a portion of 700 west mineral avenue from industrial park planned overlay district ipplo to multifamily residential mfr all in one presentation and then we'll have a uh, public comment period with that and then council will consider each item separately after that Okay, so I'm gonna turn, and again, as I said with the previous item, as um, Ordinance 40 is a, a, a quasi-judicial rezoning, um, there are very specific criteria that we have to make those decisions, make sure as we're going through that those criteria are either are met or not met. So I'm gonna turn it over to the city uh, manager. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, you covered much of, I think, the uh, introduction. I'll just uh, underscore from the start. Uh, this property is one that is commonly referred to as the, the, the Lumen property, and I think probably most folks here know that there are a couple, there are a, a, there's a couple different moving pieces here, and as you'll hear from staff, um, the items on your, on your agenda tonight uh, refer to one portion of that property that is intended for a residential uh, development. So I know staff will, will point that out, but in terms of criteria and the actions that you're taking tonight, they do not, uh, they do not apply to the, um, the rest of the property. I, I know that our, our planning staff will call me on it if I said that technically incorrectly, but I wanted to just kind of start with that uh, note for all of us here. At this time, I'll turn it over to our our staff who can introduce themselves and uh, give, the, uh, give the presentation tonight. Thank you very much, uh, City Manager. Uh, City Council, before you this evening is a rezoning and amendment to the future land use and character map. Um, if I may ask, I placed the uh, presentation on the laptop at the dais there, or at the uh, lectern. All right, thank you so very much. There we go. Uh, before you this evening, as I mentioned, is a rezoning and update to the future land use character map for a property that is actually the southern portion of 700 West Mineral. So it's about 17.42 acres of that site. The site is over 63 acres. There's actually just a touch more uh, that would be included in the rezoning because uh, the right-of-way is also a portion of the rezoning because we go to the center line of the right-of-way. So it's a little over 18 acres that is proposed to be rezoned. Uh, and the same is true of the future land use character map. So the rezoning is, from, is proposed to be from industrial park planned overlay district to uh, multifamily residential. And then the future land use and character map amendment would be from suburban business park to suburban residential multifamily. Uh, background 63.274, uh, excuse me, acre sites. So that is uh, the current, you know, as previously mentioned, what we refer to as the Lumen site. It was uh, originally subdivided in 1969. Uh, <clears throat> the original use was industrial. Subsequently, it has been changed to an office use. In uh, 2019, the Envision Littleton Comprehensive Plan was adopted, and it designated the subject property as Suburban Business Park. In 2021, uh, the Unified Land Use Development or the Unified Land Use Code was adopted, and the subject property zoning was therefore updated along with the entire zoning of the city. Uh, in this case, it was updated to IPPLO. And then the site is currently nearly vacant uh, and is under contract to be purchased. Neighborhood outreach. We, there were two in-person, <clears throat> excuse me, two in-person meetings, uh, April 13th of 2023, August 29th of 2023, has been on the, act, uh, the development activity list. Public hearing notices, there were 338 notifications 
uh, via postcard, as well as to um, SPOA, an HOA in the area. Uh, that was the original uh, notification for this evening's meeting. However, uh, the code does allow us to, on occasion, expand that notification boundary. So the second map uh, that you see uh, is the expanded notification boundary. The, the purpose behind that was that uh, none of the residential, with the exception of one apartment development, received uh, notifications within the 700 feet. And we had heard from a number of the residents that you know, that they live close to this uh, in you know, decently close proximity. And so we did want to get the word out to them that uh, it would be on the agenda tonight. So that's what that second, uh, second image depicts. Uh, it was also posted in the newspaper. Uh, notices were posted on the property and then at the city buildings. Application details, uh, as mentioned, the, we're gonna take the rezoning first. Uh, in regards to the rezoning, from industrial park, planned overlay district, to multifamily residential. And then the rezoning, one of the th items that a rezoning does is it removes the PLO designation, which is basically that there's an underlying document, uh, a planned development document, that uh, was developed you know, back when the subdivision was originally created. It's been modified a couple times since then. Um, that document would no longer apply to this southern portion of the property be, due to this rezoning. Application details, tried to outline a little bit um, to give you somewhat more of a sense of, of scale of the location that is proposed to be uh, rezoned. So it is that southern portion of the site. Uh, Uh, housing and housing, uh, excuse me, diversity has been indicated as, as high priorities within the city. Uh, MFR has previously been located near IP and BC uh, zone districts. For instance, just to the north of the site, there is a, an MFR zone property. And uh, there are also a number of nearby amenities to the site including retail, commercial, private, and public, recreational, and educational amenities. Uh, application details, so the report goes through and details uh, the uh, five items, consistency, compatibility, traffic, uh, adequate public facilities, and natural environment. Uh, happy to go through that in more detail um, in the question and answer period, um, rather than going through all of those independently at this time because we also have to talk about the future land use and character map items as well. Uh, future land use and character map amendment oftentimes is referred to as the comprehensive plan map. Uh, we have a, a touch of a different terminology. Once again, it's the southern uh, 17 plus acres of the 63 acre site. Uh, current future land use designation is suburban business park. Proposed future land use designation suburban residential multifamily. Uh, the suburban residential multifamily is a subset of suburban residential, and that is closely tied to other suburban designations, including suburban commercial. So the, the suburban uh, characteristic within the comprehensive plan uh, goes over not just residential but commercial. And the commercial areas to the south, to the west, uh, are encompassed within this uh, suburban commercial designation. And so it's really talking a little bit more about the sense of scale of the area, the sense of character, the sense of place, trying to um, divide the site uh, more evenly between building open space and paving than more of an urban environment or more of a rural um, or rural residential environment. So because these two suburban designations are would be side by side, <clears throat> is staff's opinion that is in keeping with, uh, with the character of the area and uh, complies with the criteria that we'll get to. Um, it's and then the uh, character item, excuse me, decision criteria are compatibility uh, impact mitigation, the comprehensive plan, and changing conditions. 
As indicated, the comprehensive plan uh, pulled out a couple excerpts from that plan to indicate that the suburban character is uh, is something that is shared amongst the southern and western properties as well as what would be proposed for the site. And then changing conditions, I think this is uh, an important item uh, to, to touch upon. Changing conditions include uh, the change in office space environment and the uh, what the global pandemic has has done in shifting the needs of office space. Different employers have reacted different, differently to uh, to that pandemic scenario situation, and has oftentimes resulted in uh, less need for office space. And in this instance, the current property owner has basically determined that they no longer need this as office space. They can accommodate their employees in other ways, whether that be through uh, operating from a home environment or at a different location that they own. And so I do think that changing conditions is, is a crucial item for this uh, discussion. Application materials. Uh, in the packet, there's the uh, resolution and ordinance, as well as exhibits, staff reports, a number of documents from the applicant, including their decision criteria, comprehensive plan checklist, development data comparison, economic analysis, and then found on the DAO, the development activity uh, list, there's a, a number of other items, including our review comments and responses, title commitments, will serve letters, et cetera. Excuse me, Jared. Could you spend just a minute more on the DAO, just what that is, you know, the without the acronym so that we all can hear kind of what's out there and available? Yeah, again? absolutely. Absolutely. I, I do know that we have a, a couple newer uh, city council members, and so we do have um, a div I apologize. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe you are well-versed in the DAO, so I apologize. We may have audience members that, that are not as familiar with it, but... Um, is a website that uh, links to our uh, internal e at software. And so once we upload something onto that software, it gets placed on the DAO. So on the DAO, you're able to either navigate a map and select uh, a location and find out more information about that location. Or if you have an address or a project a case number, you can also type those in and it will pull up um, all of the cases associated with that address. If it's the project, if it's the, the case number, it's the most specific item. And uh, there typically are a whole host of attachments there uh, that go all the way through uh, the very beginning of a project all the way to kind of where we are today. So it can be through a number of reviews. You'll see a lot of uh, documents and, and responses from staff. Uh, there's also documents related to the pre-application meeting. So most of these items would first have that pre-application meeting and then go into um, a full-blown submittal. And lastly, just wanted to touch on that we have been placing uh, neighborhood meetings on the DAL as well, on the development activity list, rather than using the acronym. Uh, and so if you ever want to know about upcoming neighborhood meetings and files associated with them, that is also a good place to, um, place to visit. City manager, you look like you want to dive in here. I'll be the city attorney, but yeah, city attorney, some, sorry. if there were a property in which you saw some activity or were curious as to what was going on with it, you can look that property up online and it will give you all the information as to what's happening. Thank you for that commercial. We'll now get back to regular uh, programming. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> recommendations, staff and the planning commission uh, have recommended approval of the rezoning that is found in Ordinance 40 Series 2023, as well as uh, staff and the planning commission recommend approval of the future land, excuse me, future land use and character map amendment uh, found in Resolution 119 series 2023. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce and turn it over to uh, our engineering division. We have uh, Kyle Morris in engineering and Aaron Human uh, traffic engineering. Something. Uh, thank you, Jared. Um, as Jared said, my name is Kyle Morris. I'm an engineer with the Public Works Department, um, conducting a majority of the review as it relates to traffic on the development. Um, uh, so today, I just wanted to talk to you about um, a few things, first being 
uh, how we uh, analyzed the rezoning application in relation to traffic, and that was really um, informed by a relatively simple document. That's a trip generation study that that has a, uh, a comparison of the proposed multifamily use compared to a, f a full utilization of the existing office use. Um, as well, we, we also wanted to talk um, about a comprehensive traffic study we have required from the developer um, really early in the phase, but it was not used um, in consideration for the rezoning, but it helps us um, get a better understanding of impacts to, to the entire region and the Mineral Avenue corridor. I just um, want to jump in real quick. So yeah. you compared it to a full use of office space, not current use of empty office space. Is that that correct? is, that is correct. Enough. The the current use is very low, as previously stated. Um, additionally, uh, we have Aaron Human, city traffic engineer, with us to go over um, some regional studies and projects that the city is currently conducting, and also just wanted to touch how um, we we go about the process and. Uh, Final approvals and you know site plans and administrative approvals uh, and requiring uh, the developer to mitigate adverse conditions that they they will create um, by increased traffic specifically for the retail. There's they've, they've shown a, a decrease um, in generated traffic for the multifamily um, compared to the existing office use. Thank you, Kyle. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Like Kyle said, my name is Aaron Human. I'm the City Traffic Engineer. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the bigger picture for a minute before we got, dive back into the development, the specific development here. Um, as most of you know, and maybe the two council members already know this, we um, have a transportation master plan that was adopted back in 2019, and that's kind of our guiding document as we move forward with variety of different transportation projects and to help guide development projects in our city. In this particular case, when we're looking at just the rezoning of this residential property, it is adjacent to only one, uh, one street within the city, which is South Park Terrace within the South Park Industrial Park or Industrial Area. And to be frank, um, back when we did the transportation master plan, this area was one of the difficult, more difficult ones to assign class, roadway classifications to. And the reason roadway classifications are important because it's kind of what guides us of what we're looking for from a developer for what they're required to do when they are developing adjacent to a roadway. So I'll get into that in a little bit more in, in a minute. In this particular case for South Park Terrace, we identified it as a suburban connector. And you can see up there, there's different characteristics that we assign to different roadways. In this particular case, a, sub a suburban connector, um, we look at it from the standpoint of <clears throat> not only uh, what land use is near it, but also uh, what kind of uses are gonna be needed upon it. And, and the reason it was difficult in this area is because there is no existing residential in the South Park area right now, at least in this area. So when we looked at the transportation master plan, we didn't identify this roadway as a priority for pedestrians or bicycles. But of course, if this rezoning was approved, when we do an update to the, um, to the transportation master plan, which is planned for next year or two, that'd be something we consider to change about it. And I'll, I'll get into a little more of that in just a minute. Um, so speaking specifically about um, a suburban connector classification, you can see it. I, we identified some key characteristics that are in the transportation master plan. When we're looking at a roadway, we think about how much right of way we're going to need to fit whatever characteristics we need in there. We look at what kind of speed should be operating for a traffic standpoint on that roadway, what's acceptable, how many lanes there should be for not only vehicles, but also for pedestrians and bicycles, what type of accommodations they need to have. And then really looking at what's the purpose of this roadway. What is it serving? What kind of land use? And then also, are, is there a need for parking or not on street? Um, in this particular case, within the South Park area, they've identified all their roads as not having on street parking. Um, so that's something we need to take into consideration when we're planning or working with a developer on a, a site like this. In this particular case, uh, for South Park Terrace, what's being proposed is a detached sidewalk to accommodate uh, pedestrians, which if you know the area at all, there's quite a few streets that only have sidewalk on one side. And as this type of development comes in, we're going to take the opportunity to add more facilities for pedestrians and bicycles in this area. So speaking of bicycles, what's called out for this type of roadway is on-street bike lanes. But from 
recent conversations we've been having with council in general, we're trying to progress our bike lanes beyond just putting stripes on the ground. But in this particular case, what we'd probably start out with are buffered bike lanes, which again is just stripes on the ground, but with the ability in the future to create a space where we can protect those bike lanes once we have the both staffing and maintenance capability to, um, to keep those clear, both from debris and from snow in the winter so they can be usable year round. Um, so I just want to clarify too, when a development comes in, they are obligated to meet infrastructure modifications that meet the classification that we've recommended in the transportation master plan for any immediately adjacent roadways. So now I want to talk a little bigger picture because I know this has been an interest of many people in community and, and um, city council lately. You know, when, when we want to point out that a development comes in and they have certain requirements, but as a city staff, we're also looking big picture at what some of the long-standing issues are in the city and the area that we're addressing through other projects. And so I kind of want to touch on some of that real briefly here in case anyone has questions about that. So first I want to talk about Mineral Avenue because I know that's a very, um, <laughs> it's a street that every, everyone's very interested in and what's going to happen to it in the future. Mineral Avenue is a corridor that's very important to the city of Littleton from a transportation standpoint for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, it's one of the few east-west um, major roadways that goes through our city. It is the only one that goes entirely through our city and extends both to the west into Jefferson County and to the east into the rest of Arapahoe County, if you consider it, it pairing up with Dry Creek Road. It also has, as most of you know, the Mineral Light Rail Station at one end of it, which is a focus of ours as staff and as a city to to utilize that transportation service as much as we can. We're one of the few cities on the system that are fortunate enough to have two light rail stops within our city, both here at the Mineral Light Rail Station and then in the downtown as well. And then if you look at the land use on Mineral, Jared kind of talked about this a little before, we have quite a variety along this corridor that extends from dense residential in some areas to commercial and a variety of different retail and, and um, um, and other shops that are along there. And then also we have schools. Um, so it, it's quite the variety that we're trying to accommodate with a pretty important corridor. So we want to make sure that we give a lot of attention to mineral. And I think as we go through these projects, you'll see that we are. And the last thing I want to touch on about the corridor before I talk about projects is the importance of it being multimodal. So we're not trying just to accommodate vehicular traffic on mineral, but trying to accommodate all modes of traffic because of its important to our community. So what you're seeing up here on this map, um, I've identified the nine projects that are immediately in the area that don't have anything to do with the development, but are ongoing projects that the city is currently working on, anywhere from um, planning projects all the way up to getting ready to go to construction. So as I start from the west with number one, what you're seeing there, I, I'm sorry, I want to back up for just a second. Before I talk about these nine projects, what they're all focused on is a combination of anywhere from safety, multimodal, mobility, connectivity, and in some cases, capacity and operations. We're looking to improve in all those areas with almost every project we, we move forward with in the city right now. And then I want to point out that these nine projects were able to, be, to happen because of 12 different grants that the staff has gone after and was able to secure to bring in the funding that we needed to move these projects forward. So getting into them starting, like I said, at the West End, first one we have is Mineral Station um, West, is what we're calling it, which is basically to allow connectivity of bicycles and pedestrians from the Mary Carter Greenway to the Mineral Light Rail Station. The second one is Santa Fe and Mineral Improvements. Most of you probably know this as the Quad Road Project. Um, this is a very large project and probably one of the biggest ones we've done in the city since the depression of the railroad back in the 90s. And the significance of this one is not only to address regional traffic issues, but also to work with the development in, the, in that area to provide a lot of multimodal connectivity um, as well. Moving to the east, number three is the Mineral Mobility East project which is um, a safety and connectivity project specifically for pedestrians and bicycles 
along Jackass Hill and along Mineral Avenue in the area uh, close to the light rail station to make it safer and, and easier for people to get to the light rail station without having to, to get in their cars. Uh, number four is one of the newest ones that we will be taking on next year, which is a study of the Highline Canal Trail underpass of Mineral Avenue. This came out of the Mineral Mobility East project as something that the community really want us to look at. So we'll be taking a look, closer look at that to see if it's feasible to create an underpass there and not have to have the at-grade crossing um, of Mineral Avenue. Then we also, over on Broadway, number five is Broadway and Mineral Avenue intersection, which is specifically a safety study, again, to improve bicycle and pedestrian uh, crossings at that intersection that we'll be starting next year. Number six is County Line Road Shared Use Path. That is a project to add um, pedestrian and bicycle connectivity along the south side of County Line where there's limited or none today and to connect to the C-470 trail. And then we also have two more on Broadway that I want to note. Oh, I'm sorry, one more on County Line first. County Line Road Widening, which is east of Broadway. It's a project that we're doing with Centennial and Douglas County to widen that corridor all the way from Broadway to University. And then the two last two I, I inferred before was on Broadway. First, we're doing a corridor study that's looking at Broadway all the way through our city and actually is working with adjacent municipalities as well to look further to the north and south. But that's primarily focused on accommodating a variety of different um, transportation, land use, and economic considerations in the future for what we want that Broadway corridor to look like. And then finally, the last one, which might not seem significant to most people, is the Broadway Fiber Phase 2, is what we're calling it. And what that's doing is we are currently installing our first public fiber um, optic line on Broadway at the northern end from Arapaho Road to the north. This will extend it all the way to the south to the extent of our city. And that allows us to have much more reliable and better communication with all of our signal systems and allows our, our IT department to be able to transfer data from buildings around the city as well. So I know it seems like I went through a lot of projects quickly, but the point being here that regardless of development in the area, the city is focused on this area and especially the Mineral Avenue corridor from not just a traffic standpoint, which is usually the thought, but to make it a multimodal corridor. And that'll be something that we'll be working with the developer when they do the commercial part of this property to make sure we're um, extending that along mineral in front of their property. So that was kind of the big picture. Kyle, like he mentioned before, has been working more closely with the developer on the actual review. So I'm gonna turn it back over to him so he can talk in more detail about the ongoing traffic study and the other elements of the proposed development. Absolutely. Um, so for a bit, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the comprehensive traffic study, like said before, was not used in consideration of the recommendation of approval for the rezoning. Um, but it's just to show um, how we're moving forward and taking a comprehensive view um, and uh, on the impacts that the overall um, commercial and multifamily um, development, redevelopment uh, will have on the region. Um, so what we do with the comprehensive tra traffic study, um, it's, it's performed by the development team, but they, they work very tightly with, with me and Aaron to develop a comprehensive scope on it. Um, it we first develop uh, several study intersections that are included in it. Um, for this one, it's, it's very wide sweeping. It goes all the way to Santa Fe, um, from Santa Fe all the way to Broadway along Mineral. Um, it, includes South Park Lane, South Park Terrace, and also um, County Line Road. Um, from there, they, they use the Institute of uh, Transportation Engineers uh, trip generation manual um, to estimate uh, proposed trips that are generated by both the multifamily and the anticipated commercial developments. Um, then they, uh, they take uh, counts at all of the study area intersections, and we use those counts to um, inform uh, distribution of those proposed trips from the development. Um, and on top of that, they use uh, Denver Regional Council, Council of Government guidance on uh, uh, growth rates over the next 20, 20 odd years out to the year 2045 um, to analyze future year scenarios for future proofing. Um, they also include uh, known developments within the study area that have already completed or have um, ongoing traffic studies, and those are incorporated. Uh, 
and they also include all the, the, the projects that Aaron touched on previously because they, they can include capacity improvements and geometry changes to those intersections. Um, from there, they look at all those intersections for um, typically delay time and queuing, so that's, that's capacity of the intersection, turn lanes, and how long people are waiting at the intersections. Um, and if, they, if we identify any um, you know, adverse or failing conditions, the developer is required to mitigate those. Um, and that can be anywhere from signalization, which have to meet um, specific standardized warrants, which are typically either a peak hour or four hour warrant. Um, and they could add turn lanes to existing intersections or uh, another typical one is uh, simply extending the capacity of uh, existing turn lanes. Um, next slide is just an overview. Sorry, there's a delay there. Um, a visual to show how broad sweeping uh, this comprehensive traffic study is. Um, and it's important to note that this traffic study is not approved yet. It is, it's, it's ongoing. We've, we've looked at it once um, and we're, we're working with the development team to, to have this comprehensive strategy to, uh, to mitigate their impacts. Uh, now going back down to the rezoning consideration itself um, for the Embry multifamily, um, it really did come down to the trip generation study, um, which is a simple comparison uh, of the proposed development, which um, when they provided that trip generation uh, study, they showed 400 dwelling units for a, a conservative analysis, and I, I believe down to 380. Um, so, so it is a conservative analysis, and they use that standardized uh, ITE, the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual, um, to, to perform this comparison, and it, it does show a, reduce, uh, a reduction in peak hour traffic of that proposed uh, traffic compared to a full utilization of the, um, the office use, as previously stated. Um, and then to go further into detail uh, for fi final staff approval <laughs> on the site and what we look forward to touch on the multimodal aspect that Aaron was talking about, um, specifically on South Park Terrace because that's the only public right-of-way frontage that um, the multifamily lot has. Um, it includes uh, eight-foot wide sidewalks with a 10-foot buffer yard um, and also right-of-way dedication that um, can accommodate you know, future bike lanes and additional potential uh, multimodal improvements or intersection access improvements um, as we uh, finalize that comprehensive traffic study. Thank you, that's all I had. Next, we'll be hearing from our economic development consultants. So, uh, Mr. Knutson. All right, thank you, Jared. Uh, Mayor and members of council, I'm Andrew Knutson, and with me, my colleague, Colton, Colton Hargup. We are with Economic and Planning Systems, and we are here to provide an overview of the fiscal and economic analysis of this uh, rezoning. Uh, the firm, uh, Economic and Planning Systems, we've got eight lines of business, all related to land use economics. The two that we will be drawing from for this work is the real estate economics, specifically market understanding, supply and demand by asset class, what could happen here? And then the other is fiscal and economic impact, which is the uh, crux of the, of the effort. Uh, we uh, have an office based here in Denver. We've been, that office has been open for 23 years. We do a lot of work in the metro area and a lot of work for the city of Littleton. So we are familiar with the market, familiar with the uh, fiscal structure of the city and are building upon that analysis for this uh, report. Uh, we've got uh, three elements in the slide deck and then we've got some additional slides on economic <laughs> impact if there's interest in that. Uh, the first we'll cover is the development program and uh, a couple scenarios of how it could build out and based on those scenarios what the fiscal ramifications are to the city. 
Uh, the, the fiscal model assumptions, we want to go down the road uh, with a couple slides to show you the methodology of the model and create some transparency in terms of how it functions, what it accounts for, and how it generates its results, which is the final part, is the fiscal impacts. Uh, the fourth part is economic impacts. Economic impacts is job generation, that kind of thing, if there's interest in that. Uh, the development program is summarized here, uh, and we have, uh, we assume that it will develop as uh, multifamily, as stated. There's a lot of clarity around that, 380 dwelling units and a specific acreage of 17.7 acres. Uh, the balance of the site could either develop as commercial in the form of retail or industrial. And uh, if it goes retail, it's just under 500,000 square feet of retail, uh, 496, 301 to be specific, based on the remaining lot area and a 0.25 floor area ratio for retail, which is very standard. That's kind of etched in stone in terms of how retail, the amount of retail that can be developed given a lot size. <laughs> now, is 500,000 square feet too optimistic? Possibly. Uh, if so, we went with scenario two, which assumes 100,000 square feet of that gets developed as industrial and only 400,000 th 400, square feet of retail. As, just as a rule of thumb, a given King Supers, kind of the traditional, not the new expanded format, but historic, around 55,000 square feet. So, so that's kind of an increment that you can visualize. Uh, a couple big box stores at this location, 150,000 each, 300,000 square feet and two big box. That could happen without uh, a significant amount of risk in terms of market support. Uh, this sector of the Denver metro area is strong in terms of demographics, strong in terms of expenditure potential, and short in terms of supply. So uh, there, generally it's under-retailed, and the idea that two big boxes would find uh, interest in this location is not uh, not unrealistic. Uh, the balance of that with some mid-boxes, some pads, and some ancillary in the form of 100,000 square feet plus I'm going to interrupt industrial. you, Mr. Knudsen, just to let council know that, uh, unfortunately, the um, second phase is not really relevant to tonight's uh, discussion here with that. So it's, we're focused on the residential. Thank you. Uh, we will move on. Uh, we do have, this is uh, the introduction to our methodology and basically what we're trying to do is concentrate on the per capita cost to run the city of Littleton. What does it cost per resident? What does it cost per employee? Knowing that everything generally breaks down into residential and commercial uses. So we have taken the city budget and identified the population by hour of the day, to tell you the truth, accounting for that portion of the population that both lives and works within the city limits as well as in commuters, as well as out commuters. All of that goes into the model. We have our denominator in terms of our uh, per resident, per employee factor. Numerator is the budget, and we have dollars per unit. Uh, we apply that to proposed development to ultimately understand the costs the city will incur to serve the new development. And my colleague Colton will go through the specifics on that. We've got four more slides. just just to set expectations. If I could ask, just to kind of focus what we're doing, if you could focus on the uh, cost and benefits of a residential um, so that we can kind of keep the conversation focused there. Sorry, I'm, I'm asking our uh, consultant to please just focus. I think it'll help us all to uh, focus on the residential portion if we speak to the ability of the project uh, to support there with a general statement about, I, I know, the importance of the residential project to the commercial. But I think um, just to, I think to the mayor's point, to, to keep us clear on what the decision is tonight, it's about the uh, residential portion. So if you could hit some themes, that would be helpful. Uh, we can certainly do that. How about if we do three scenarios, one, 100% residential, and two, because they're in the slides already, we'll hit them lightly. but. They are in the slides, and they're the couple different scenarios. Thank you. But the emphasis will be on residential. Okay. Thank you. I think sure. that's important. Perfect. Okay, so um, with our modeling effort, um, we try and link revenue and expenditure line items to specific 
um, nexus to growth factors is what we call them. Um, so for some of our big primary revenue sources, such as sales tax, property tax, use tax, we're going to do a case study approach. Um, that estimates those revenues use, using uh, project-specific data. Um, we have four additional nexus factors um, linking future growth to residents, uh, future growth to commercial employees, and then our service population nexus factor, which is derived from our proportionate share methodology. Um, we also have this fixed revenue and expenditure line item. Um, that just indicates that there's no nexus to growth and the future development does not impact uh, that revenue or expenditure. Um, so you can see here our general fund revenues. We estimated these um, revenues based off of the year-end estimate uh, for 2023. Uh, the city's primary revenue source is sales and use tax. It's 82.3% of uh, city revenues, so that's going to be the focus of our study. Um, that was estimated using a case study. Um, you could see the additional nexus factors there um, linking each revenue uh, to a nexus factor. Um, and then if they were estimated, they were assumed to be 100% variable. These are general fund expenditures. Um, almost every single item here was estimated using our service population nexus factor. So again, that proportionate share methodology. Um, each expenditure item was assumed to be between 25 and 100% variable. Um, that's just to acknowledge that the city can accommodate uh, future development with existing infrastructure, staff, et cetera. Uh, the net fiscal impact here, so we have scenario one, scenario two. We'll go over that briefly. Uh, uh, let's, if we can, let's start with scenario three, which is 100% residential. Sure. Uh, scenario three not shown, but we do have the figures that we were just studying before uh, this meeting. Uh, it's a net negative fiscal impact, uh, $255,000, $80,000 in revenues um, with the balance in um, expenditures, about $335,000 uh, to make up that that fiscal net negative impact. Um, there are also associated use tax revenues that uh, came in around about $2 million. Um, those are one-time revenues and um, not ongoing, so not included in the net fiscal impact. Um, and I do want to emphasize this is at build-out, um, so when the development is fully built out um, for the residential piece. You can see once the commercial comes online, um, under scenario one, it's a positive impact of $3.6 million. Scenario two, it's $2.8 million. Um, largely because of the sales tax revenues, um, which are substantial. <coughs> that should do it. So that, uh, that concludes what we had prepared uh, for the, to summarize the analysis for your consideration. Uh, we can talk a little bit more if you've got questions about the balance of land use and how this residential proposed <coughs> development uh, compares to typical residential and the corresponding impact on city finances, if you're interested. I just have one quick question, kind of summarized specific to the residential. You know, I said it was a net negative because serve, the cost of services of residents outweighs the property taxes um, that those residents, that, that's the summary of that, specific to the residential portion here, right? True. Okay. One clarification is that we did capture the spend from these residents uh, that, and the amount of dollars that they would spend within the city of Littleton. So there's... You know, there, yeah, there's, there's some, the but the net was, right? That's okay. Correct. I just wanted That's to yeah, accurate. summarize that Summarized. succinctly. Okay. Any other council any other questions for the economic? Sina, thanks. Okay, thank you. Next, we have the applicant presentation. So I'm just pulling that up for you. And I'm, I'll just make a, a few comments while the applicant gets uh, situated. So, you know, council tonight is being asked to make a couple of different decisions. One is uh, amending the future land use and character map. Um, the reason that that's being done is because that is part of the comp plan. So when we get into the rezoning, um, that is criteria that it is consistent with that. But when council, and we've been, Council has been provided with a lot of background information, including an economic kind of analysis that we've done, which is not necessarily criteria for a rezone anymore within our jurisdiction, as well as all the traffic um, projects that the city has been involved with. Because, quite frankly, I'm not going to spoil it for anyone, but I think you'll probably hear during public comments some concerns about traffic. 
um, on mineral. So I'm not going to jinx it. Are you um, attempting to predict the future, no, city no, attorney? No, 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 no. But but I'm going to say that the list of criteria is is pretty specific in terms of what it is that council is going to be considering, and when it relates to traffic, one of those considerations is not necessarily that you know traffic's a mess at Mineral and Santa Fe. We all know it is, but as it relates to a rezone and as it relates to a requirement on a on a developer. What a developer can be required to do is to mitigate any adverse effects that their particular development is going to have on our existing roadway network, not solve regional transportation issues. So um, I think it's great as a background information for our council to understand the various projects and grants and work that is being poured into this area of town, as well as for our citizens to understand that we're not forgetting about this area of town. but we really need to confine kind of our thoughts in terms of in our considerations to this particular parcel, which is proposed as multifamily residential. And what are those impacts going to be in terms of um, traffic? Certainly that's one of your criteria, as well as well as whether or not the city has adequate facilities to be able to serve that development. And so I will turn it over to is the applicant, the applicant but yeah, just okay. kind of applicant, want to bring please. us back into criteria land. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Grant Nelson with the Republic Investment Group. Uh, my company is under contract on the 63 acres. Um, I appreciate you taking the time tonight. We're here uh, tonight about this redevelopment. Everyone talks about it as a development, but it is a redevelopment of an existing facility. Um, we are here tonight with our residential development partner, Embry. Jimmy McCluskey at the end there is uh, with Embry, and we have a team of consultants here uh, with uh, the legal consultants. We have planners, we have engineers, we have traffic engineers uh, that are here at your disposal should you have questions. And we're here to ask any, answer any questions you may have. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Marcus Pachner with the Pachner Group, and he will lead through this discussion. You guys could feel the whole baseball team here. He's going <laughs> to hit cleanup. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Marcus Pockner. I run a community outreach company that specializes in land use and community outreach and has been integrally involved in this site. I do want to say on behalf of our entire team, we appreciate your diligence uh, working with staff. Staff has been remarkable in preparation and background and working through the challenges and also to the larger community who's been incredibly involved and has really led to what we call inclusive planning, where we have learned so much from the community and included those into our planning documents. This is a brief timeline of the last two years, really an accelerated timeline on this site because perhaps this site more than about any other had such a rapid and adverse effect effect from the COVID uh, situation. This use, we'll talk about it. But Lumen, as we've all heard, closed their facility. They made the decision that this type of facility would not work any longer or that similar uses would not work on this site. Went through an RFP process, a very competitive process with developers across the area competing for this site. Republic and Embry were selected. We did a project kickoff here in February. The two neighborhood meetings that have been detailed that were very important to this process going to Planning Commission last month, unanimously approved on both of these motions, and then here before you this evening for second reading. I do want to state just from a, an existing context, everybody knows the site. We certainly have many neighbors here that know it very well from that lens as well. Uh, we cannot state enough that this is a vacant, underutilized site that will not be used for the current use again. Um, they decided uh, that this use, this type of call facility will not happen, went through their own process of doing an RFP to select and to really have somebody go through building the vision and creating the plan for this site. I said, certainly note the existing conditions of this is really embedded in South Park. You think of South Park, the business park, the communities, the educational facilities, Littleton Academy, just to the east of this site, and really some great neighborhoods and residential uses, South Park, South Bridge, and the peninsula, and all of those uses really in a suburban context on this site. I will be very specific. Everyone has done a terrific job of kind of reinforcing. We are only here on the southern 17 plus acres, that area there in green. That is the subject of our two distinct but related requests that we are seeking. 
excuse me, from all of you. So we are here, as has been said, on these 17 plus acres to ask for a rezoning from the industrial park uh, planned overlay to multifamily residential, and then asking for the corresponding amendment to the future land use and character map. Again, staying in the same suburban context, but changing it to suburban residential multifamily. This is that context. You learn a lot thinking about this in concentric grids. Those are half mile radial increments when you think of this site. Everyone knows this neighborhood really well, but to think of those half mile increments, you think of the South Park, uh, the South Bridge across Menrill, thinking of the Office Park, Littleton Academy, really starting to get into significant ribbons of greenway and trail space. The next half mile takes you more into that residential, incredible re or, uh, trail amenities and opportunities opportunities, and then even further into significant regional roadways. This is a five minute cycle ride to the mineral station. It is a very integral site. You heard from city staff really detailing all the plans that you're looking at, but looking at this site, but the importance of finding a 64 acre site and the opportunity that that presents, certainly catalytic, but also the opportunity to have an actual complete neighborhood in this site, which we believe we are certainly adding to. When we look at community engagement or any plan, we always start with two things, the plan guidance. What does the comprehensive plan say? What do your underlying plans say? And what is reflected from the community and how can we incorporate those values into the plan? Um, our philosophy in community engagement is to use that very same concentric outreach model. We believe that the most affected property owners are the adjacent neighbors and we go out from there and really try to hear from them and incorporate those changes, those suggestions. This shows the two community meetings. There has been continued engagement post planning commission. We've actually had two community meetings, two direct meetings that I'll speak about. But you see all of those adjacent neighbors, then South Park, they're certainly adjacent, the plaza, the owners association, the hospital and vibrant Littleton. I'll certainly talk about them. And then because of the importance of this site, the overall, the regional leaders and stakeholders on this site as well. Just certainly a flash, we'll hear from many neighbors, but this is a, a snapshot of some of that community engagement, how important it was to meet with Littleton Academy to understand what they wanted to see as far as traffic controls on Mineral, those two stoplights on Alati and Mineral Avenue, to hear really South Park Owners Association, to want to see residential, to add to that complete business park, to have residences that are taking advantage of future retail and the business park that's there. The chamber, certainly working with them, housing, the policies that you all have. And then again, Vibrant Littleton, there's been a lot of discussion tonight about the opportunity to continue to enhance the fabric of Littleton, to add to the multimodal fabric. We spent a lot of time with them, particularly Post Planning Commission, focused on pulling some of those elements into this site. I will note that the residential rezoning that is before you is that edge, that buffer that pulls in all of that Panestian connect connectivity into the site instead of just a power center or a retail center. We really become the basis of making that pedestrian connection and anchoring the site. Um, here, I think it's important, you've heard a lot of information about the public improvements. We believe public improvements is an integral part of neighborhood outreach. It is those improvements and how we mitigate any impacts that we do that. So I'll now turn to Curtis Rowe with uh, Kim Lee Horn. Curtis will go through our traffic analysis of this site and just touch briefly on the comprehensive analysis that we've done on the larger site as well. Curtis. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. My name is Curtis Rowe. Uh, I work with Kim Lee Horn and Associates. I'm a traffic engineer. Um, I have 30 years of experience um, doing this type of work. Um, I'm other than also a professional traffic operations engineer, I'm also a professional engineer in the state of Colorado. And then I am also the uh, professor that teaches traffic engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, part of this, uh, as Mr. Morris described, um, our first task was to provide a comparison of trip generation for the proposed rezone of the residential property, or what we're looking at for the rezone of the residential. And that 17.4 acres, with the potential of, of having 400 residential units, generates 150 um, peak hour trips in the morning and approximately 200 peak hour trips in the afternoon. You can see that in the table there on the right. When we compare that to the office, office space that was there previously, 
and what would be allowed under the current zoning, you can see that this residential use generates about half the traffic of what an office would generate for this same site area. Um, previously, um, that would have generated 300 trips in the morning and um, 300 trips in the afternoon as well. So about a third less trips uh, with residential than the office in the afternoon peak hour. And so as City of Littleton staff identified and recognized, uh, you know, this rezone generates less traffic than what an office use would. And so from a traffic perspective, uh, you know, that's a positive in terms of less traffic, less noise, less congestion. But obviously, you know, the site is vacant, and we are preparing a comprehensive traffic study, as was described. And so we're currently working with uh, the City of Littleton staff. Um, it's a comprehensive study, as described by Mr. Human and uh, Mr. Morris, where we are evaluating a full extension of the uh, surrounding area. Um, but you know, the questions may be, how will traffic enter and exit out of this residential site? And so focusing just specifically at this site location, what we're looking at is proposing traffic signals at Mineral Avenue and Mineral Place. So that's the corner there on the northwest portion of that aerial. And then another one, it's Central uh, Mineral Avenue and Alati Street. And so uh, both of those would provide access to the residential. In addition, um, along Mineral Avenue, uh, there is a five-foot right-of-way dedication. Uh, that's being um, implemented along that stretch. And so that is so that we can actually dedicate separate right turn lanes so that the bike lane that's there today doesn't have to be absorbed into the right turn lanes. So we're gonna separate the space. That will be a safety improvement. It'll provide a multimodal improvement for the area and for Mineral Avenue. And then the last one there, um, as described previously, is the 20 and a half foot right of way dedication along South Park Terrace. And so that is for multimodal considerations with the pedestrian improvements and also right turn lanes along South Park Terrace that will be at the access for the residential. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Samantha. I've got one quick question yes, for okay, you. Great. Just on the, no, two quick, I, ha I have one, he's got one too. Okay. Um, for the trip generation, uh, yes. just for clarification, that's the comparison of proposed, um, or a little bit more than the proposed residential units and office office space just on that portion, not office space on the entire 63 acre parcel, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Great question. I appreciate that clarification. Yep. Just that site. And I also wanted to, this is going to get to traffic engineering nerdiness. So congestion is one of our factors and criteria that we need to evaluate as part of the traffic study. As part of this study that you're going over right now, you're, the, uh, the calculation you did, did show a net difference in trips increasing. However, net differences in trips at peak hours are decreasing. Would you say what has a greater impact on actual congestion that commuters actually feel? Total number of trips or peak hour differences? Great question, and that's a very good observation. As you mentioned, the daily traffic that's generated by residential will be higher. Office, you go there in the morning, you work all day, and then you leave. Whereas residential, you have traffic coming in and out. But in terms of the impacts, the reason why we study the peak hours is because that is the time frame that has the highest volume on the adjacent streets. And so that's the volume that we want to minimize. And so in terms of congestion and impacts, we want to reduce the peak hour traffic. Spreading it out throughout the day is actually a benefit to use that traffic in other hours. Okay, thank you. Yes. Great, Good okay. Job. Thank you. So, and I'll be available for other questions too as they come up, but otherwise right now I'll turn this over to Samantha Polmiller from Norris Design and she'll provide the uh, next section, thanks. Thank you, Mayor, Council. My name is Samantha Paul Miller. I'm with Norris Design. That's 1101 Bannock Street, Denver, Colorado. And as Jared noted, we're requesting two applications for approval this evening, an amendment to the future land use and character map and a rezoning from IP PLO to MFR. All right, first we have the future land use and character map amendment 
For context, we've outlined the larger preliminary plat boundary in the gray dashed line on the screen, and the 17-acre portion that we're discussing tonight uh, is shown in the darker black line. On the left side, you can see the existing condition, which is suburban business park, and we're requesting to change to suburban residential multifamily, as shown in the green diagonal hatch on the right. And since Jared did not go through the approval criteria, um, I will go through that in a little bit more detail for you this evening. Walking through those decision criteria, we'll begin with compatibility. The city's comprehensive plan and zoning policies are based on community character. This character-based approach focuses on three things. One, development intensity. Two, scale and form. And three, site coverage. Both the existing and proposed designations fall under the suburban character umbrella. So there isn't a ton of change in that regard from a character standpoint. And as Jared mentioned, there are other existing multifamily communities within close proximity to the site, which you can see on the screen in that green hatch. This amendment creates a designated area that allows for infill multifamily homes that could add to the existing community fabric and help support existing and future commercial developments. Next, we have impact mitigation. This proposed amendment and associated redevelopment will replace the existing underused building and parking lots with a site plan that not only supports the suburban character, but also designed to comply with the current code standards. Redevelopment will improve the stormwater management of the site. It will require transportation improvements that we've gone through, I think, in great detail. And it will improve the pedestrian network and circulation from what exists today. The amendment also encourages more complete mix of uses, allowing people the opportunity to join the Littleton community and add additional diversity to what already is a mixed-use neighborhood in place of that single use that's there today. Speaking to the opportunity of housing, the comp plan specifically notes a need for almost 7,000 additional housing units. The city's housing study expands on this further, and it notes that there is a strong need for new high-density development since much of the city is already developed. The comp plan goes on to note that transitions can occur through redevelopment of previously built sites, and that a more fine-grained mix of uses that support each other can emerge in its place. In this case, the approximately 17-acre residential site is part of a larger redevelopment that is intended to add commercial retail and services secondary to the primary office focus that covers much of the balance of the land in this area of Littleton. The mix of uses helps create a connected and accessible neighborhood compared to the vehicle-dominated, vacant, single-use development that exists there today. And finally, the changed condition, we kind of touched on this, but the site shows the evolution of employment space over the last 70 years. The site began as manufacturing and was then converted to office. And then again, with the pandemic, the demand for office across the country declined, prompting Lumen to decide to close their facility in early 2022. This proposed redevelopment is evidence that the market and priorities of the existing and future investors of the site have changed, which the comp plan maybe didn't fully comprehend or anticipate back when it was last updated. Next, we have the rezone request. On the left side, you could see the existing condition, uh, which is an industrial park slash plan overlay district, or IPPLO, it's a lot of letters. And we're requesting a change to multifamily residential, or MFR which again is shown in that green diagonal hatch. The ULUC has five decision criteria for rezoning. First is consistency. With the requested future land use and character map amendment, rezoning the site to multifamily would then comply with the comp plan. Further, the multifamily zoning improves capability, compatibility, excuse me, with the surrounding suburban character of the rezoning, of, so, bleh, sorry, let me start over with that one. <laughs> the multifamily zoning improves compatibility with the surrounding suburban character and the rezoning complies with a number of specific goals and policies identified in the Envision Littleton comp plan, such as contributing much needed housing without disrupting the established character of the existing residential neighborhoods, 
and increasing both the quantity of housing and the diversity of housing options and, and, um, and further development under the MFR zone district requires compliance with the city's inclusionary housing ordinance, further con contributing to the attainable housing options within the city. Next is compatibility. As I mentioned earlier, this rezone enforces a consistent suburban character, providing compatibility with the adjacent properties. This rezoning also implements the lot and building standards included in the city's unified land use code. These landscape buffers and setback requirements will create thoughtful transitions between existing and proposed uses. Third is traffic, we've mentioned this. The preliminary traffic report demonstrates a reduction in peak hour traffic compared to the existing and approved office use. And as noted in the staff re report, a comprehensive traffic study was also submitted, which studies the broader redevelopment and identified improvements to mitigate potential impacts. These include traffic signals, right of way dedication for turn lanes, as well as new detached walks for improved pedestrian connections. And finally, the natural environment. The proposed redevelopment enhances the natural environment because of the required requirement to be in compliance with the city's current standards. This includes new landscaping and updating stormwater facilities to comply with the current standards. And finally, I just wanted to touch quickly on the main difference between IP and MFR zoning, and that is the allowed building height. IP zoning allows for four stories or 55 feet in height, whereas MFR zoning allows for three stories or 40 feet in height, which that height is arguably more compatible with the surrounding community and other residential in the area. And with that, I'm going to hand back the podium over to Mar Mar Marcus Parkner to wrap up the applicant presentation. Great. Great folks, we are closing our final few slides here. Just want to note probably what is not before you tonight. We've talked a lot about what is before you, but I think it's really important for the public to understand that there are many additional steps we are going through in addition to the uh, future land use amendment and the rezoning. Um, after this, on just this 17 acre portion again, we will go through a master development plan. That is a site plan exercise that goes through all of the planning associated with generally a site plan. It will talk about the construction documents and the building permits. We will talk about roadways, permits, some of the pedestrian fabric, all of those things that you see. Again, this is the comprehensive plan and the rezoning for that. Um, I do want to particularly note that there has been a great deal of community engagement and support and incorporation of those values. In no way does that mean that we have unanimity of opinion or nor will we ever achieve that on this site. What is important is the collaboration has led to pedestrian improvements, very significant traffic calming in this area and across the site, off-site infrastructure and residential benefits. I do want to particularly note and again step away and say that this is future applications, not before you tonight, but we wanted to be sure and note that we have had ongoing meetings with Vibrant Littleton post the Planning Commission. Planning Commission both you know, voted unanimously to support both applications, but we heard about having additional pedestrian connections and multimodal looking at those opportunities. So here we have shown a legend that shows future planning elements that we are going to add. And we've actually detailed, and I will in questions, be happy to go through the process when we do that. For instance, on a lottie, we are looking at a multi-use path pathway on the east side of this, not at the main retail we know, that will go all the way from mineral into the proposed uh, multifamily. That really provides that multimodal opportunity, a gathering place. Additionally, in the northeast quadrant there, we are going to have a pedestrian gathering area or a placemaking opportunity. We don't know the sites there yet on those commercial sites. We don't know the pads, we don't know the users. That will be determined, but it all goes through a site planning process on that commercial. So again, I just wanted to be sure and note this, pledge it before the mayor and council, that you will see these details as we move through on both the multifamily portion, the 17 acres before you tonight, and the future commercial portions. These are some images and cross sections that we are including on those north-south corridors and the streets so we have that. Mayor and Council, thank you very much. Uh, we are here. Thank you for being so dutiful and listening to our presentation. We're here to answer any questions that you have. Council, does anyone have any questions for the applicant? Councilmember Grove. Yeah. Your mic. 
Going back to slide 19, it went, you went through it pretty quickly. What is the height proposed? Is that the 55? Five stories and 55? Oh, yes, that one. Four stories and 55. I believe that was what the IP currently allows. And then on the right is what multifamily residential, the change, the, the reduction of potential height. That is absolutely correct. Proposing an overall reduction of uh, height allowed on the site. So the height would be 40 feet? We're going through final detailing right now with that. Um, I'll have our architect address your specific question of the height proposed. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. My name is Jeff Nylub. I am with Kephart Community Planning and Architecture, and our firm is the, uh, the architect of record. Um, so as Marcus had mentioned, uh, we would have an allowed height of 40 feet. Um, right now, where the buildings sit, it would, uh, would be lower than 40 feet, um, right around uh, the 38-foot mark is what the uh, preliminary design. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant council? No questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. S staff is done with their presentation. Is there anything else that you have to add? Uh, the only thing I'd like to add at this time is that the items to the north, uh, if they are developed within the IP and the existing PD document, would not necessarily come back before I, before City Council, but um, what is being propo proposed this evening with the uh, rezoning and future land use character map amendment, the next step in that process is the MDP process, which goes before Planning Commission. But for tonight, we're just looking at that southern 17 yeah. acres, so that's not yeah. under consideration, yeah. Correct. Does anyone have any questions, clarifying questions for staff? Well, yep. So uh, my question, I'm. I apologize, I don't, it's about kind of the financial risk of this approval for the city. I think we've established that the, um, uh, financially the, the apartment uh, rezone that's in front of us will, will be a net negative for the city or is plan expected to be a net negative of a couple hundred thousand dollars, which is, you know, uh, a small percentage of our overall budget. But then the other risks are kind of infrastructure risks. And so um, I see it within the plan there's, there's mitigation of, of stormwater infrastructure, drinking water infrastructure, um, uh, sewage infrastructure. What about uh, power uh, and Excel? I don't, how, how, I realize, I see in one of the notes that you guys send a note to Excel that this is ongoing, but who is responsible for the uh, electrical infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the applicant is required through um, additional uh, applications to provide will serve letters from uh, all the other utilities, and that would include Excel. So Excel has been uh, contacted as a reviewer on this item, the referral entity, but then they're also required to provide those will serve letters. The applicant is uh, required to ascertain those will serve letters from the utilities as well. But there's no risk to the city for financial obligations for the power service to that area. Not, not that the, I'm aware. The risk is, is more uh, probably stormwater and sewage since we run it. Those are our biggest risks, but they are required to mitigate that. That's correct though. Their required. letter says that they are paying, I think $11 million in impact fees. Is, is that accurate? I, I'm not certain if the, all the impact fees have been uh, finalized at this point in time because uh, we have we're going to be getting into the MDP documents and <clears throat> excuse me some of those documents the the unit count started at 380 and is actually ticked down to 370 so there's still some some work to be done there. So, but the primary financial risk for the city right now is the decrease in revenue because of 400 residents that cost more money than they provide in terms of revenues, although they provide some revenues from what they buy in the city. And if I'm not mistaken, that scenario, just to, to clarify, and we, we do have, um, yeah, uh, Mr. Canoose can help us out on this, that scenario uh, was for if the entire 63 acres, or was it for the smaller side? Okay, so I apologize, that is correct. You have that correct, sir. Thank you. Thank you. 
<clears throat> City Manager, did you, were you going to comment? Um, to Councilmember Reichardt's question, um, I believe the applicant would be able to speak to the uh, financial, uh, you know, how the uh, residential portion fits uh, financially with the rest of the site um, because it's not negative in the end. Well, I mean, but for tonight, we're looking at just the rezoning. We can't right. look at what may or may not come there in the Correct. future. So that would, I would say, let's not go that way. Yeah, I, I would but, say just just real quick. In the past, um, economic analysis was certainly part of the equation, part of the criteria that city councils had in evaluating whether or not to rezone a property. This is no longer part of the considerations or the criteria as it relates to when the city is deciding to rezone a property now, currently. Yeah, ec economic benefits not part of our criteria necessarily there. So. Uh, Councilmember Wright, you had a question? Yes. When you reference the development team, um, who's included in that? Or what do you mean by that? Uh, I, I apologize when I reference the development team. Yeah. <clears throat> so the development team are the, uh, is the applicant. And there before you this evening, they had a slide with a number of different uh, entities. In regards to the city team, we also have uh, our team that reviews the, the projects. Um, such as we uh, refer things out to engineering, uh, traffic, and a number of other entities. So I apologize if I didn't answer your question entirely. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, uh, just prior to uh, moving towards public comment after our council questions have concluded here, I'd like to just uh, thank everyone for sticking around tonight. I'd also like to make a motion uh, to extend our council meeting to 11 o'clock tonight to allow for that adequate time for public comment. Is there a second? I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> We have a motion and a second to extend the meeting past 10 o'clock up to 11 o'clock. Um, we do have more people signed up that will get us to 10 o'clock, so that's why we're doing this now rather than interrupting someone during public comment. I will vote for that if we can also take a break after. Nope. Oh. <laughs> okay, fine. Do you want the break before public comment or after public comment? I need it before. Okay, that's fine. All right, fair enough. All right, we have a... Uh, a uh, motion and a second on extending the meeting past 10 o'clock if needed. And a side. And a side. <laughs> uh, voting is open. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Okay. Are there any other questions for staff council? All right. Well, seeing none. I will just address uh, a question that council member record brought up. So the impact fees are currently generated for the 380 uh, residential, about 1.8 million. Thank you very much. So per our side agreement in the last motion here, before we get to uh, public comment on this, which we will have, um, I'll have a, a short recess. Uh, we'll be back. Two minutes. Go. Two minutes? <laughs> I don't believe No. Yeah, I don't believe it. We'll start at 940 here. Okay, thanks.
All right, it is 9.40. We will reconvene. Um, I will open uh, the public comment portion at 9.40. We have, I think, 15 people signed up. I know a few people came in after the sheets were given up here, so we'll give them time as well after the fact. But uh, first up, we have Robert Brown. I should add, you have, have three minutes, and please keep your comments specific to this parcel of land with, uh, with the residential uh, rezone. Thank you. Good evening. And uh, for those of you who have the holiday outfits on, I admire your courage. <laughs> <laughs> so, we moved to Littleton in 1974. Some things have changed here during that, I guess that's almost 50 years. Littleton used to be very conducive for people who owned horses, but Centennial Racetrack went away, Rappo Fairgrounds went away. What went in in both of those places are very admirable. The Marathon property, if you voted for that, I'm not a fan. Well, I don't know anything about traffic control, but I do know what I see with my eyes. Traffic on South Broadway starting at about 3.30, running through 6.45 is a nightmare mostly going south. Many of those cars, if they're going west, will cut off at Jameson down to Aladdy to avoid the uh, intersection at, uh, at Broadway and Mineral, circumvent it. Now, my big concern is the congestion that's going to be created with the density. I could live with maybe a little less density, but. My dissatisfaction with developers is that they buy a piece of property and you know they've got to optimize profits so they start trying to cram everything they possibly can into a square box and that's the original presentation. It doesn't work like that. A few years ago we had some developer that wanted to put in an apartment complex on the uh, railroad spur line that was the uh, the Michelin line that runs parallel to, uh, to Mineral. All they needed was a curb cut. Fortunately, that didn't happen. That was good sense. We have a Republican form of government. We elect people to make good decisions for us. I find too often, particularly as we start ratcheting up to the national level, that oftentimes just doesn't happen. So, we're going to leave it in your hands. I can only tell you what I think. If you disagree, then that's the way it is. But um, the traffic that will be created, we haven't even gone into the rest of the program that they talked about. Um, no, it'll be untenable. But thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next up is Diane Young. Um, I, I, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Cheryl Espinoza. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. Oh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. I came to you uh, months before when this project had started, and I said that you have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to put your mark on this piece of property that will represent the citizens of Littleton for generations to come. And I want to once again to have you thoughtfully think about what this property can represent to the citizens. I was at a... a another public meeting yesterday, and the developer said, I asked the developer, uh, what about open space on this property? And this goes in regards to the, um, uh, to the property, to the zoning that we're talking about. And, he, and, and overall he said, oh, it will only include what is minimumly, minimumly required by the city of Littleton. Um, and that includes drainage ponds, uh, open space uh, is, drainage ponds are considered open space. I think the citizens of Littleton require 
deserve more than just what is minimally, minimally, minimally required. So please, please thoughtfully think about what you're voting on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Pat Dunahay. Good evening, uh, Pat Donahue, 1600 West Mineral. Uh, hi, Mayor and Council. Um, South Park, as you know, it, 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 I've heard it referred to a lot of times tonight as industrial park, and we don't really appreciate that. We like to consider ourselves as a mixed-use community area. Um, I am an elected volunteer on the South Park Board, and I have been for over 20 years. We have elections every three years for all of our board members from all of the business owners. And I'm representing those folks tonight, and that we take these kind of things because they're going to impact our life greatly, very seriously. So I've had the opportunity to meet with Jimmy and Embry on several occasions, and I've spent a bunch of time with Grant Nelson, who I've known for 23, 24 years. Um, we have 300 current residents uh, in South Park. So this is not new to us. So I feel like I kind of know the impact. I think I know what the traffic is going to look like. Um, one of the council members here happens to live in our business park um, or community park. And there are six different access roads from this location. So I know each one of them. I know how much traffic goes up and down them. I know lots of different ways to get in and around South Park to make this congestion as easy as we can because it's our job at South Park to make all this business work together. So if you all will instruct uh, leadership to make sure that we get a say in all this, I think we really can help. Uh, as the lady pointed out and the earlier fellow before her pointed out, we see this, we live it, we know it. All the studies in the world aren't gonna change what we know. Um, so we would very much encourage you to look forward to that. I, I'd also, I have to um, tell you that we spend a lot of money in South Park to save the city a lot of money. You know, we have a lot of open space, greenery, that that's what creates our park-like environment that you all like the look of. We have to take care of that. We have several detention ponds. We have a community park. Uh, we take care of all the landscape islands. We take care of traffic control signs. We have a bunch of expenses that, that we address. Well, this project and this apartment complex is going to benefit from all those. And I want to say that they have agreed to join South Park and to pay into those fees now and into the future uh, with South Park and joining us as a member, a voting member, and hopefully maybe even getting to a point where they would consider having somebody run for the board. So. I, I think their involvement level is high. I think their integrity is good on this project. I think we all have lots to do, um, but we're only gonna do it together. Thank you. Next up is Cal Murab. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Thank you for having this meeting. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Lawton Business Chamber as a co-president, and uh, the board in unanimously is approving this uh, uh, project to go move forward. Uh, it's going to be a great addition to Lawton residents. I have been outspoken about having high density residential now for many years, and this is a great project to add to the mix. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jim Gale. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Gale. I'm the president of the Peninsula HOA. Three of our five board members are here tonight, along with several other residents. We might have almost 10% of the neighborhood uh, here tonight. It's a big deal to us. Uh, today, at Sandra Day O'Connor's funeral, the Chief Justice Roberts talked about Justice O'Connor and how she was a get it done person, get it done now. And in the context of her life, it was a moving set of remarks, but we all know that getting something done can be problematic unless we do it the right way. I really would like to echo Pat's comments that it's important as this moves forward 
and some sort of development most assuredly will. The residential piece that is before you tonight, and then as we move forward, to uh, address with the communities that are along Mineral Avenue, the traffic impacts, uh, and that would include addressing traffic issues that already do exist and that would be exacerbated when we go from a, an empty facility that does need to be developed in some fashion or other to a facility that's got a good deal of, of uh, uh, traffic that'll be coming in and out of the residences and then in, in the other aspects or the other parts of the property that'll be developed later on. Um, Grant and Marcus and Curtis have been very generous in telling us they'll spend time with us. I think it'll be even more important for, for Pat and for our association and also possibly South Park too and the Southbridge people to sit down with uh, Jared and Aaron and with Kyle and potentially with uh, the Mayor Pro Tem who used to be our, our council member and now uh, Council Member Peters who's our new council member uh, as well to talk about what we do in each of our individual uh, settings. Um, very briefly, if you pull into the peninsula, driving south on the right, you've got Riders Vista Park. On the left, you've got a parking lot with 50 spots, and just to the east of there is the Highline Canal. If you come over there about 3 in the afternoon when Littleton Academy is letting out, or at a time when the park is very busy, uh, it's, it's actually somewhat dangerous with kids darting across and people parked in no parking areas and folks trying to turn in left, not necessarily um, able to see what might be happening. That's not tonight's issue, I know that. But it is all part of the equation as, as the city and as the community figures out how to go forward. You all, of course, are charged ultimately with leading and supervising that effort, not doing the groundwork, but we very much hope that you will be supportive as we try to work with, with your staff, with our City of Littleton staff, uh, toward a development that works for the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Susie or Bruce Johnston. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Get. I'm going to blame your handwriting. Uh, it's pretty bad, too. I don't, I don't write a lot anymore. Um, yeah, my name is Jeremy Gett. I live in Southbridge, too. Um, I also want to express my disappointment in the developers and how this whole project has been handled from the very beginning. You know, they put on their slides that there's two neighborhood meetings. However, none of the nearby neighborhoods were actually notified of these meetings. The only people that were notified were the apartment complexes and the nearby businesses. So depending on your definition of neighborhood, that doesn't, that doesn't meet mine. Uh, that also left thousands of people that live in those nearby neighborhoods unaware of what the upcoming projects were gonna be. So I would think you'd have a lot more people here voicing their opinion if they were notified a lot sooner. Um, they also talked about community engagement. Again, on that community engagement slide, None of the nearby neighborhoods, no, South Park, Southbridge, the Knolls, none of those communities were um, engaged. Um, it's, it's just it's an opinion of mine. I'm not sure how you can expect an out-of-state developer that does not live here in this community to care about how this project will affect the community once the project is built. Uh, traffic. We all know that was coming up as the gentleman that spoke earlier, he spoke about traffic coming off of Broadway, cutting down Jameson onto a lottie. I see that every day. And that's only gonna increase once you build a project there and have an entry point coming off of Mineral and Alati Street. And finally, the planning commission meeting, although it did pass with a vote through them, there were two members on that that really struggled, really struggled to say yes to this. They, they questioned whether or not this project really belonged in a suburban environment, and I couldn't agree more. I do not believe it does. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Kennewith? Chenoweth? Uh, 
Thank you all for being here and having this meeting. I just want to say that uh, the presentation by the developer is phenomenal. I'm a salesperson myself. I'm very impressed with their presentation. One thing that is not being mentioned, however, with their development is the other developments that are already in the works. Some have already been approved. Littleton Village, 300 multifamilies been approved. You're talking to a developer about West Dry Creek, another 300 multifamily units to be maybe approved, maybe not. Aspen Grove, uh, 500 to 700 units is being talked about. I don't know where that is. Then you've got the Insor product, uh, property, Insor Evergreen property. What is that? 5,000 units, including homes. Is it just going to be this new development that's going to use mineral? I don't think so. And the idea that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, or more multifamilies either being considered or some approved, I mean, how many will be enough? And I think that should be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a W. Donovan. Hi, I recognize a few of you people. Um, my name's Bill Donovan. I'm a, I live in the peninsula and um, my daughter lives in the pinnacle. Uh, so, and those are my only two real estate investments or interests. I'm, I'm concerned and I don't know the legal terminology of consistency and compatibility. What, what I want is buy into the community. I don't care how many people you cram in there, and there's gonna be quite a few, but would you please make them owner-occupied investments so that they buy into the community, they buy into the traffic, they buy into the sewer system, they buy into the electric grid, and know the problems. That's uh, one thing. I don't know about the mention of special taxing districts, but the Denver Post did an expose on that. I certainly hope you don't give them a run on your credit card to profit themselves. I don't know if that, that's even germane. Um, there's going to be a lot of stress on the infrastructure, and that needs to be discussed. And if you're, if you're going to have a big development out there, you're going to have this multimodal com uh, conversation about traffic and compatibility. I ride my bicycle, and I look at you guys, and I don't think you ride your bicycle to work. And uh, you know, the mineral that has a bicycle lane, and I call it the suicide bicycle lane, because it goes right into Santa Fe, you've got traffic going 40 miles an hour while you're going six. And the mass, is, mass difference is big. So um, what, I, what I'd like, you're, you're developing this, these apartments for people to get down to light rail. Please consider uh, bridges under Jackass Hill in min at uh, crossing at Mineral at the High Line. And um, Thank you very much, but no suicide bike lanes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Next up is Matt Duff. Hello, I'm Matt Duff. I live at 463 West Easter. Um, I told my wife I'd be home at about 7.15 right after I made my comment, so <laughs> I am starving right now. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I want to speak in favor of this development, so, and, and specifically the residential. Um, you know, I think uh, we have an affordability crisis, you know, and I think a lot of the people, you know, that come to these meetings are concerned about, you know, the situation now for the next 10, 20 years, you know, um, and th having things not change. Um, but I think a lot of us, we're thinking 
30, 40 years down the road, you know, when, when the, the growth of this region is, is expanding. And, and Littleton is not solely responsible, you know, for the growth of the whole Denver metro area. But it seems like to me that there's a pattern of municipalities saying, yes, yes, somewhere, because we can't say out loud that we don't support affordable housing, yes, somewhere, but certainly not here. You know, and everyone kicks the can, you know, to the other city. And then it's often left where, you know, a lot of these people end up, um, like a lot of the issues end up in places where they don't have the means um, to make to make progress. And and I'm glad that, that Littleton is, is doing our part to help overall, not just to, to try to maintain the fantastic, you know, city that we currently have, but also to think about what this is going to look like 30 and 40 years down the road from now um, when, when the, the next generations come. Um, and... Um, I also wanted to share, too, that I, I've, we've met as part of Vibrant Littleton um, with a few of the developments so far that have been coming in when they've reached out to us. And they've always been willing, it seems, to do more than the city has required. You know, and, and a lot, oftentimes they'll say, you know, we would love to do this, but this is all that's required. And, and like for one of the developments on Powers, they were saying, you know, we could put in world-class facilities and they would end with a parked car right in front of it because that's what the current road looks like. And so we have this, these defaults that we have, you know, based on what the city is requiring. Um, and I feel like that those are a much less great city than we could have if we reevaluated those. And so I'm very much so in favor of, of you know, I will ride my bike to this, you know, to this development um, and, and with these neighbors that we will soon have. Um, it's right down the street from me. Uh, and I'm excited about that. But I hope that as we evaluate things in 2024, like the master development plan and other things like that, um, that we can raise the bar a bit for, for what we expect the default to be. What does it look like? And, and, and by our guidelines, encourage and, and, and demand of these developers that they make better facilities and better infrastructure. Um, and, and fortunately, they've been willing to so far on their own. Um, and thank you. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Roger Mangan. Thank you very much. I'm going to read something to you that I've been penning since I've listened to all these conversations. I'm Roger Mangan. I live in a subdivision called the Peninsula, along with 200 other residents, more or less. Traffic is the issue. By the way, the big traffic picture tonight provided was very helpful. Thank you for that. It was pretty impressive that what you did for your work. Thank you. Um, however, I live in a micro-environment. Daily, I attempt to enter Mineral to go to work. Thank God I'm turning eastbound. A left turn westbound is extremely dangerous. I live in not only a landlocked, but a light-locked subdivision. One way in, one way out. The, <clears throat> the random use of the pedestrian crossing light at Mineral and the Highline Canal currently renders traffic flow chaotic. When there are sporting events, soccer, baseball, and the Little Academy Charter School uses Ryder Park parking lot as a meeting place for parents to pick up their children, this creates a dangerous bottleneck for traffic, causing not only double parking, but a dangerous back log jam. I understand there's a traffic study process which in, in process, which indicates to me there are challenges, if not problems, with the lumen development. Not sure why we are bifurcating the decision of developing the Lumen property from the traffic study. It's like the tail wagging the dog. Should we not know the results of the study and its attendant impacts before we consider approving a change in zoning? It reminds me of the cardiologist who is well into his bypass surgery only to find out something significant about the patient that if, had he known it, he would not have begun the surgery. A solution? <clears throat> A Highline Canal tunnel under mineral jointly funded by the city and the developer. The development of Lumen and the pedestrian tunnel should, be, should not be a separate project. Thanks for allowing me to share. By the way, I would suggest the city council visit the mineral Riders Park intersection when school lets out and in the spring when sporting events occur. Go there. See what it's like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Pam Chadbourne.
council I ask you not to approve this, and um, many of the speakers have said why. Um, but first off, let me say, there is no right to rezoning. There is no right to a rezoning. The current zoning and the PLO are better for the city, and you don't have to give people a rezoning. There is no right to get one. Even if the criteria are met, there is no obligation for the city to give that rezoning to someone else. We are fine as we are. My understanding is in the state, courts will defer to your decision. So don't fear this decision. The city has other obligations and so do you. As was mentioned, you act on behalf of us. Your job, you are paid to do, is to perform due diligence on our behalf. And as has been observed, that due diligence has not been done from the city's impact over time for the build out of the new zoning over decades. That can be done. That's a professional job. We don't have it here in the city. City planners, we haven't had for 15 years. It's a technical job, a professional job. We need one we've got in opening now, and I hope that has been writ written well, um, that application. So our current plan integrates different uses, which works well. We, this site functions as borrowed open space for the neighborhood. Others are more dense. That is purposeful. That is good design. <laughs> Don't replace good design with bad. So, uh, Let's see, the city needs the integrated impact of the build out of the FU, LV, LU and zoning over decades and the whole 63 acres. You can't evaluate this separately. And let me just say, the proposed retail and the rest of the site, can those workers, there's hundreds of workers just at the Costco, can they afford to live in this housing? Nine units would be required by the IHO versus hundreds of people at the Costco who pretty much probably can't afford this. Did anybody ask about the rents are? I don't think so. So on this site, the city doesn't know that the people who work here can live there. It just breaks a fundamental live, work, play. And it increases traffic on mineral for those workers to come back and forth. This is a spectacularly bad decision for the city. Also, the current zoning was for good jobs highly paid jobs, and those folks could afford to live in Littleton. Um, this is a bad plan. It, it's unsafe for mineral, as people have pointed out. Regardless of the mitigations and the multimodal, you can't do it safely. Um, this, this is a bad choice for Littleton. Please say no. Thank you, Ms. Chadbourne. Uh, next up and last person to have signed up uh, is Keeley Quinn. Anyone else that wishes to speak that didn't sign up, I'll give you an opportunity. Hello, Mayor and Council. Um, thanks for being here for this late evening. My name is Keely Quinn. I live in District 2. Um, and I would like to give a big thanks to the development team for engaging in conversation with Vibrant Littleton, of which I'm a member, um, and including the idea of public space and a 10-foot path along the development in their presentation. Um, I am excited to see that Littleton is being open to change with the rezoning passing the Planning Commission. Um, as I know, change can be scary and has often been shut down in Littleton in the past. I'm excited to see new housing off of Mineral. This will be a great opportunity for employees of Littleton Hospital and so many others to live near where they work. In conjunction with the Mineral Mobility Improvements and the city's stated focus on multimodal transportation in this corridor, we as Vibrant Littleton are asking that the developers commit to and are held to mobility improvements within and around both the housing and proposed future retail developments. This includes a commitment to a 10-foot multi-use path for the length of a laddy within the housing project and future retail or commercial developments. Additionally, the potential retail developer has verbally committed to a public gathering space and we ask that they commit to be and be held to allotting half an acre to a public gathering space in future conversations. This would be similar to developments on 29th near Central Park and the Highlands Ranch Town Center development off Lucent and Highlands Ranch Parkway. Littleton is a beloved and desired place to live because of its small town feel. In order to maintain this and also see economic growth, we need to have intentional and creative developments. 
and incorporating shared spaces and increasing mobility will help to keep the small town feel and also see increased sales tax revenue. I look forward to continued conversations with the developers and with council to ensure that this project is good for everyone in Littleton. I look forward to all of my new neighbors and I hope that someday we will see this area utilized to its full capabilities with parents and kids gathering in a public space with a coffee before or after a trip to a large retailer and before heading home. I know that we can do it, we just have to work for it. <laughs> Traffic is frustrating and as we build housing for new Littleton residents, we need to focus on multimodal transportation as that is our only way to reduce traffic congestion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilors. I'm Elizabeth K. Marchetti and I live in District 2. First, thank you for considering this land use map amendment and rezoning application tonight. Thoughtful consideration of how to manage change in Littleton is so important, and this area of the city is a unique place and opportunity. I'm with Vibrant Littleton, and our group has been engaging with the applicants for the last month on issues related to safe, high-quality design and infrastructure for the entire site, not just the residential portion. We're excited to see more housing coming to a part of the city where retail has struggled for lack of adequate residential density in close proximity. More households should result in more successful retailers for years to come. We've been encouraging the developers to consider a site-wide design approach that includes the residential and commercial components together as one potentially great place. We're encouraged to see that the developers team has put real time and energy towards the street, bicycle, and pedestrian infrastructure design. We're also happy to see thought put into a modest community gathering space. While we want to trust the good faith efforts of the developers up to this point, we are concerned that creating a great people-centered place for our community will slide down the list of priorities during the review of a future commercial development site plan if these concepts are not somehow formalized with the applicants now. And in order to further support and solidify these efforts, we'd like the council to add at least one new section to ordinance number 40, series 2023, that goes something like this. All future site plans and site plan amendments for the commercial development of the land bounded on the south by the future residential development up to Mineral Avenue at the north and from South Park Terrace on the east to the western boundary of the development shall include the following. A minimum 10 foot wide multi-use path running north-south along the length of Alati from Mineral Avenue south to the residential development. An internal east-west road that includes, at a minimum, detached sidewalks and enhanced crosswalks, and a connected, activated community gathering space of at least half an acre. Memorializing these key design concepts in the proposed ordinance is an efficient way to ensure that these elements appear in any proposed site plan or site plan amendment. I'll always defer, defer to the city attorney, but current and future planning staff and landowners will likely have a much easier time ensuring applicants comply with council direction via the ordinance compared to relying on a recorded video of oral testimony tonight. We hope you'll seriously consider this proposed change to the draft ordinance in service of great placemaking. Again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, woman in the front here. You could For the record, that might be the only time Ms. Marchetti has listened to legal advice. So. Kidding. That, that's, un that's uncalled for. Do you need a sticker? My name is Lois Warren. I've been a board member on the South Park um, Town Home Association for the past several years. I listened to the presentation. No one ever bothered to contact us <clears throat> in the in our neighbor, oh, I'm just doing a terrible job here, I apologize. But you talk about community engagement. I haven't been contacted as a board member. The only way I knew about this meeting was one postcard that I received a couple of weeks ago. I had no idea there were other meetings in April or September or any other time. Um, and I don't think anybody in our neighborhood has either. We've heard rumors. Um, 
about the commercial development, and I know I'm not supposed to talk about that, but for if there's going to be a vote on a zoning change for the whole property, you really need to take into consideration what the people in the community think. Come at, come at 5 o'clock and try and drive down Mineral. Try and get to where I live, coming down Broadway. It's crazy. And adding another stoplight or another two stoplights within a quarter mile is going to be chaos in terms of traffic. Um, let's see. I think these guys have done a wonderful job. They've been paid a lot of money as a development company to come here and provide a very slick presentation. Please, before you make any decisions, think about the people in the neighborhood. Um, okay, I'm off track and I apologize. I'm very nervous. The housing development could be very fine, depending what they build and how they build it and how they make access to mineral. Commercial space, another problem. That's a huge problem for that area. Um, I also want you to think about the local schools. I have grandchildren who go to Runyon Elementary, which is where these, um, the kids in this housing development may go. I don't know if you've spoken to the school boards about how this is going to impact the, the children who are already going to those schools. Uh, it's just a consideration. That's all I've got. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. I have a gentleman in the back. Hi. My name is Phil McCart, and I'm a Littleton parent to an 11-month-old baby girl. I live in South Park. I'm one of the closest people to the Lumen site here tonight. And I'm also a member of Vibrant Littleton. I'm here to speak in support of this rezoning application. The largest barrier to prosperity that my generation faces is the ability to have anything at all left over after paying for rent. For those of my generation who are not fortunate enough to purchase a house by now, the prospect of becoming a homeowner, homeowner is all but hopeless for the richest, except for the richest among my generation. <laughs> I just want a future for Littleton where I, as a single income family, can afford to buy property. I want a future where I can afford the space to have more kids than I currently do. I want a future where my daughter could afford to buy a home near us if she so choose to stay near us. And I want a future where money will not prevent her from wanting children of her own. I want lots of grandchildren. However, despite skyrocketing housing costs, some of our neighbors here tonight, who are almost certainly comfortably housed themselves, are here to convince us to stop building additional housing. Yes, it is true that the housing crisis is a national problem, but is it also true, it is also true that for the last 40 years in city council meetings across America, citizens have resisted housing development, most notably in places like Silicon Valley. What's also true about places like Silicon Valley is traffic is horrendous. Yet no group of communities have been more successful in stopping housing growth than those in Silicon Valley. The reason is quite clear, it's not debatable. When you forbid, for, forbid housing from being built near employers, you force it to be built further away. Not approving rezoning tonight will only continue to incentivize develop in development in places like Sterling Ranch, but also it will force those people that live in Sterling Ranch who have no other option, they will have to drive their cars and they will clog our roads. They don't have any other options. At least building housing nearby, there is a chance that they won't drive. In addition to that, they won't pay Littleton taxes to people who have to live further away because they can't live closer. I'm asking you to please choose the future of our children and our grandchildren over a perceived fear of traffic and a loss of character. The Lumen property has served Gates Rubber, and then Martin Marietta, and then Lumen. Now, please let this portion of the redevelopment now serve our children as homes next. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen in the blue. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council members, uh, my name is Charles Class. I live at 431 West Jamison Place in the Southbridge 7 neighborhood. Uh, I came here tonight because I hadn't heard much about this whole development until I got the postcard in the mail about two weeks ago. And I thought I wanted to hear what was going on tonight because this is the best way. I hear a lot of rumors, you know, from neighbors and things like that, but nothing really concrete. I think there's probably just two or three quick things I'd like to say very spontaneously. One is I agree with some of the comments that have been made tonight. I don't think the communication has been great with the developer so far. Uh, I live on, this, on the north side of Mineral Road or Mineral Avenue, and this is really the first chance I've heard to, to see what's kind of going on right now. Uh, I think the second thing I'd just like to say very quickly is, um, and I think the lady just referenced that, is we need to think about the school system. I realize the city council is not responsible for Littleton Public Schools, but the reality is if you have 370 or 380 units, how many kids are we going to be adding to the school system and are we going to create a crowding problem? I realize right now our schools, you know, have some capacity, but I think that needs to be part of the consideration as well. Is, are we going to overrun the schools a little bit, especially, let's say, the middle and the high school, you know, where we got kids going to school and they're not going to Littleton Academy because that's a charter school. I think the third thing is uh, I have nothing against these multifamily units. Um, I honestly think, you know, it's fine as long as, you know, we talk about affordability. I'm not sure what the affordability is going to be because it's kind of hard to find multifamily units under $500,000 these days. You can do it, but usually they're very, very far away. So I think as far as livability goes, it's a question mark that just needs to be considered. But I think, you know, the bigger concern and what I hear with a lot of people, and that's my concern as well, too, is what's going to happen from a commercial side. Because we've heard a lot about the traffic, and I have the same concern. And, uh, you know, if you've gone through the Aladi and uh, Mineral Crossing, I've watched people there almost get nailed a few times. So I'm happy that the developers put in a, uh, you know, proposal for a traffic light there, because... I think it's just kind of an opportunity waiting to happen where we're going to have a serious accident at some point. But I do think that these are the things that need to be considered by the City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience? Yes. Council, thank you for uh, having us this evening. Uh, my name is Tim LeVere. Uh, I do have the pleasure of serving at Council's discretion on the uh, Board of Adjustment for full disclosure. Uh, I'm not entirely opposed to this uh, proposal entirely, but I do question whether it is compatible, and I would really take a look at that requirement to see if compatibility is right. We do have this section of our city designated as industrial uh, for, for this commercial aspect of it, right? Something that's not retail, something that's not residential. Once you convert it to residential, you can't take it back. And once you do convert to residential, you do start to have problems with not in my neighborhood uh, for the reverse side of those things that do generate revenue for the city. Uh, we had a proposal a few years back for a car repair shop type deal uh, for luxury cars to go where I think O'Toole's is about to go. And that shop was going to back to the Southbridge 7 neighborhood. When that uh, plan came forward. People did not want that type of uh, heavy industrial use so close to the residential. So I think putting this high density residential in this format uh, in the heart of a industrial park will maybe cause additional friction and limit the future use of the industrial park. It may lead to more residential in there until the whole thing is residential in 100 years, 200 years, whatever it is. But as we know, residences cost money to the city. The taxes don't support uh, what, what the services cost. So uh, please consider the compatibility requirement as you go through this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, especially for the second chance. Um, I would agree. Could, I, could you introduce yourself for the record, please? Uh, Pat McCall. I live in Southbridge townhomes. To correct some of the other Southbridge uh, characters of the associations, last I counted, there are 10 HOAs in Southbridge. 
from high-end single family down to townhomes. Um, it's over 3,500 residents. I would think that'd be a concern for the constituency of our council member. Um, yeah, anyone on the north side is going to be hurt enormously by this development. Um, this, this affordable housing, I, I just got to say, I've been landlording uh, for 40 plus years. Um, at, it's the biggest crock I've ever heard. As Pam described earlier, this apartment complex is going to provide eight affordable units. Wow, that's going to solve all of our problems. And how much are we giving up for property for those eight affordable housing units? What a, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I rent my places two, three hundred dollars below market in Denver because Littleton's too expensive for renters. You're going to find out when you build all these units, and Colorado's pretty notorious for crashing the market, and then rents will get cheaper. You guys going to, is Littleton going to compete with Denver? Is Littleton going to compete with some of the surrounding suburbs over all the units that they've built? I think you're going to have a tough time. Um, you know, I, I appreciate all the comments that oppose this. Traffic is an issue. I'm afraid it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I've been in that neighborhood for 30 years. The traffic in the last two years, just as someone described, from Arapahoe Road to Jamison Avenue, right across from Littleton Hospital, has doubled every day. It, it's not changing. I'm getting gas at Costco over in Sheridan at 6 a.m. because of traffic on Santa Fe. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak to this item? All right. Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public comment at 1027. City Manager, yes? Mayor, I had to process a comment that I heard, but I do want to... Uh, Comment. I think I heard a, a suggestion that the city lacks uh, uh, professional land use and uh, transportation capacity and staff. I'm making this comment because um, it, the, it is a critical issue for this, this project and as we move forward in that part of town. But it's critical that the council and the public are aware that um, our land use and you know, transportation planning and, 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 and engineering staff are top notch, top qualified, and our modeling, as you heard a little bit of tonight, impacts of all of the development. Um, as more uh, as more development happens, there will be more traffic. Um, but I just want to make the comment that we're going to continue to have more conversations in the community about general transportation planning and projects that are in the works and we have a very qualified and a committed staff and I'll mention that at least one of the gentlemen at the table across from me does ride his bike to work very frequently so uh, <laughs> anyway thank you mayor thank you um, at this time I'd like to give the applicant a chance to respond to any of the comments there Thank you, Mayor and Councilor. I am happy to respond to a number of the comments that I heard, and we may have additional team members that want to do that as well. Again, we have a full balance of team members. I do just want to address generally a couple of things uh, just kind of off the top to think about this site. Uh, the commercial, the suburban commercial that is zoned today, the retail and those uses are the uses that are allowed today. We are seeking rezoning of the 17 plus acres for residential. All of the factors and so many of the comments that you heard tonight about the increase in traffic and not wanting to see more of those traffic, retail has more traffic trips than residential. We are bringing in a softer residential buffer, a lessening of impact on scale, still in the suburban context, and actually lessening the traffic impact. 
So when we talked about our 17 acres versus a proposed office use, it shows a less traffic impact in the AM and PM peak hours. We are that buffer that is pulling in pedestrian connectivity. The proposals that you heard from the group about a lottie, the 10 foot multi-use trail, those are really connecting to those anchors. So, so many of the great public comments, that is the very element of what we are bringing in from a residential community. It is creating a complete community. I wanna be sure and respond about housing. One of your seven tenants in your comp plan talks about housing and complete neighborhoods and moving forward. You need housing variety. You have 29,000 primary jobs in Littleton, 2,300 of them plus both live and work in Littleton. We are building housing so people have more opportunities to both live and work in Littleton. People then mentioned traffic and said driving to a different Costco. We are changing the migration patterns. Those existing patterns that are going to a user, it is changing that pattern and bringing it to an integral site within the community on access roads that is there today. So there's also a net change in that traffic pattern today that is gonna change. We completely concur with all the sentiment that has been brought up about that comprehensive traffic study. We are doing that, we are part of that, we are a big partner in that as we continue to move forward and we'll go through site plan analysis as we do that. I just wanna be sure that all of the elements, there were a couple of specific things uh, about inclusions that we have, right, Mayor, in future phases, right? We know that mixed use trail on a lottie. We will show that in our master development plan. We think it is a terrific idea. The inclusion of South Park, the changing of the eight foot um, sidewalk, the trail, and the 10 and a half foot, that will be in our MDP as well. So we showed that map so everybody understands. We're not just saying that we actually entered it in to things we are gonna incorporate into future processes on this. The other thing that I wanna be sure and note, and just I think it's important, there was a lot of comments about the initial comment about the economic analysis or impact if this is residential. Folks, it's the inverse of this. This is a 64 acre site today. They don't develop as 64 acre retail sites any longer. This is the component that allows the future uses and the other phases to develop as well. And it brings a horizontal mixed use to this site. So we think it's not, to set that aside, it is the engine that makes the deal work for this to move forward, for there to be all the different components in a mixed use community. So I would look at this as the integral part and why again it provides that. Lastly, I'll say from a compatibility and change condition, no other use has changed more than a call center, this type of center, than this use from COVID. This has been a remarkable change condition. We meet all of the approval criteria and the compatibility, there are 300 plus net residents already in South Park, all the neighborhoods you have heard from, we are staying in the same suburban context and adding residential uses to add to the business park and retail uses are there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a long night. Um, those are just a few of the comments. I'm happy to go through them. I do also want to note, actually, I think there was terrific sentiment about being great community partners. I represent, I think, about 10 community uh, consulting organizations that are live and operate and have been, as myself, a Colorado native, know this area like the back of my hand. We are part of this community. Embry has 12 plus communities in this area and we absolutely strive to be great community partners. That's why we're already talking with South Park and Vibrant Littleton. So we accept that challenge. We very much look forward to being part of the larger community. I certainly will turn if there's anything else that needs to be addressed. Perhaps there is. Here comes Samantha. Marcus is hard to follow. I just wanted to point out a clarification. Um, and Jimmy can also testify to this, but uh, it's a 5% of the units for affordable housing. I think the number eight or nine was thrown out. It's actually uh, 18 based on the current uh, estimate. Even though that's not part of this application, it's future MDP, but something to consider. I just wanted to clarify for the, for the record. That's great. We'll be happy to answer any additional questions that you have, but I think we tried to go through most of the issues. Thank great. you, Mayor. Thanks. Uh, Council, does anyone have any questions for either the applicant or for staff? Councilman Grove? I think I saw this in a multitude of documents that we read for tonight, but can you talk about the, these are all rental units, correct? Yes, that is correct. And what is the average 
rent. I, I think you had something, you had studio, one bedroom, two bedroom. I just can't find and recall the figures. No problem. I'm going to turn to Jimmy McCluskey with Embry to answer your question, Counselor. Sorry, I almost fell over there, too. <laughs> for a while. Um, Jimmy McCluskey with Embry Partners. Um, the, it's a combination of one, two, and three story buildings. Um, it's, it is a mixture of studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. And the rents would range anywhere between like $1,700 a month. And this is market rate. This doesn't include the 18 affordable units. But the market rate would be uh, anywhere between 1,700 units up to like $2,700, $2,800 per month when it comes to the larger units. Um, we haven't finalized the unit sizes, so it's based on a rent per square foot based on the size of the units, but that's what the typical range is. And, and just for the record, that's not part of the decision criteria. We're doing the rezone. That would be part of the MDP process moving yeah, forward. Yeah, I, I was just curious. I, sure. I just couldn't find the figures in yeah. there. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Council, anyone have any questions? I have one question for the city attorney, uh, more on the process of why we have on the agenda. Uh, so we're considering two um, items here, a resolution and an ordinance. And I know we talked about, you know, the kind of the order of how they go. Can you kind of explain uh, with the order of what we're doing? Because, I mean, they really go hand in hand. Um, uh, one necessitates the other and vice versa. So can you just explain um, that a little bit? Yeah, I think the thought process behind it was normally we would do our resolutions either as consent items or on general business. And by putting the future land use map under that ordinance, it, it allowed us for not to bifurcate city comments or public comments in the sense that people could comment on the future land use map and then have to re-comment during the public hearing on the ordinance. Um, the other consideration was the fact that the future land use map um, and its consistency as part of the comp plan is one of the criteria for a rezone um, in the ordinance. So that was the thought process behind taking the future land use and character map first um, to make sure that the ordinance, when you're voting on whether or not it's consistent with the comp plan and all adopted plans, that you're able to check that box in the criteria. So if it was uh, vice versa, if the ordinance were considered first, it would have to be contingent on the resolution passing after the fact. Correct. Yeah, you would have to condition that approval on approval of a changing of the future land use map. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Peters. Um, I feel like we heard multiple times some frustration with the 700 feet. I'm not totally sure what my question is. How do we as a city respond to that? It sounds like we notified a little bit further for this meeting tonight, which is maybe an admission of some guilt, but how do we? I think that we can have that. It's not really part of the rezone, separate. but okay. separate will be part of kind of the ULUC update we get Put to. It and I know a... we've had that discussion previously uh, when you weren't on the dais, and I don't know we'll have that discussion um, in the future there. Councilman Grove. So we heard a lot tonight about um, additions that would be appropriate. And we can approve with conditions. I don't know that we want to do that. But if we didn't do that, let's say we just approved as is, is there a way to convey all these suggestions about, um, you know, working with the schools and, and traffic mitigation and all this other stuff? How can we, com if we do approve it, how could we communicate what the community wants if this is approved? I mean, what is the process without approving with conditions? Which I don't know, I think it might be difficult because it gets into the MDB process, which is not really our purview. Right. Your staff has taken pretty copious notes tonight. Uh, and we will be, as a, a staff, you know, circling up about how we can work with the applicant to address the themes that we heard tonight. Um, so that's, that's step one. I believe you'll hear from the uh, attorney that, uh, you know, given this is a rezone, I don't want to preempt, it's hard to condition, perhaps? Um, well, I would say, going back to Ms. Marchetti's comments, um, and I think they echo a lot of the things that we've heard from certain citizens over the past few weeks as it relates to kind of 
layout and how pedestrians interact with sites. Um, I, you know, in terms of those types of items, specifically in regard to some of the requests, those would be happening on a different portion of the property. So we would not be able to condition this rezone on uh -huh. any of those items because they affect the, the northern parcel. I would say in terms of some of those general themes, they're probably um, better addressed during the MDP process. So when, when Planning Commission, and that's who will hear the MDP, takes a look at some of the decision criteria, there's a greater emphasis on layout and how uh, those particular, the entire development interacts with one another. So in terms of expanded sidewalks and that connectivity, that's something that's probably better addressed in that process and not this process tonight. And so that would be something that maybe would include down the road if, if approved in the presentation to Planning Commission to consider in the MDP process. I'm, I'm sure it will. And being familiar with Planning Commission's deliberations, uh, that is some of, the, some of the things that you heard is something that they were very sensitive to in their deliberations. So okay, thank you. I guarantee it'll come up. Councilmember Driscoll. Yes, uh, Mayor, I move to approve Ordinance 40-2023. Uh, uh, resolution. Order. You want me to do resolution yeah, first? Yeah, do the resolution first. Okay, fine. <laughs> I move to approve resolution 119-2023, approving an amendment to the future land use and character map for a portion of 700 West uh, Mineral Avenue from suburban uh, business park to suburban residential multifamily. I'll, I'll second that. Have a motion and a second from Council Member Royden. Uh, Council, any um, discussion on the approving the resolution? Mayor Pro Tem. Yep, um, I'm gonna quickly run through this. Um, the, we have four different criteria, compatibility, impact mitigation, comprehensive plan alignment, and changing conditions as part of our criteria for this particular resolution. Um, I find that the compatibility portion of it, uh, or let me, let me start with the impact mitigation. Um, I should say that uh, I appreciate the due diligence of the contractors and consultants working on this, looking at the stormwater mitigation and uh, sewer mitigation for uh, rezoning for this property. So um, continue those efforts in, in close coordination with our city. Um, appreciate Norris Design's uh, very uh, comprehensive review of the comprehensive plan alignment and pulling out uh, components of that comprehensive plan in the, in the um, analysis of its applicability to this project. Um, compatibility, um, I'll probably say it again here as well. Um, my, uh, as was pointed out by one of the speakers earlier, uh, my home is actually part of one of the multifamily residential units that is also within the South Park uh, Business District. And so I take a little bit of umbrage when I hear uh, public comment with regards to the fact that it is an incompatible use. I currently live in one. It is perfectly compatible. Um, and uh, honestly, we might need to stretch our imagination of what compatibility is. If there's already existing residents who are happily serving on city council, part of a project that is nearly identical to what is being proposed. So I'm in favor of this resolution. Thank you. Council. Anyone else like to speak to the resolution? I, I would say that the, the real challenge for us with this work is actually the um, uh, transportation master plan work because I think what we are setting ourselves up for is to have a, a pool of tranquility as this area is for our bikers, as this area is redeveloped between suicide, um, between suicide uh, lanes on mineral and figuring out how to get our transportation plan, master plan up to snuff so that all of mineral is a safe um, a corridor for ped and uh, bike traffic. That feels like the challenge is really being laid out for us to make this future um, um, uh, neighborhood a better place for multimodal transportation. Yeah, you know, after listening to uh, the presentation, by the way, wonderful job, and, and certainly all the comments. Thanks again, everybody, for coming out and staying so late. Um, you know, I think we, we there were a lot of assumptions tonight. The assumptions that you know minerals can be overwhelmed with with more traffic. When I know that area very well, and I think about Republic distribution there, and I think about all the uh, opportunity to go south out of that area. 
uh, to get to uh, maybe where you need to go, whether it's Santa Fe going down, you know, County Line Road, or if you have to get go out east, you can certainly head uh, um, east on County Line. Um, you know, I think also about what used to be there, Lumen, right? Now we all got comfortable with none of that traffic, right? Well, something's going to go in here. Something's going to go. So what do you want? What, what, what makes sense? And I think this makes a lot of sense. I'm talking about the residential. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, I hear about the schools, and I've, I've heard about the schools in the past, and mostly Aspen Academy. And so I think that's really just a... Um, uh, a workaround with the schools to find a compatible way to pick up these kids and and, and doing it in a safe environment uh, away from the peninsula and, and uh, um, so yeah I'm in favor of, of uh, this rezone and I think I think we're on the right track to seeing a really cool community. Councilmember Red. Yeah, I agree with um, Councilmember Barr and Redguard and uh, Driscoll. I believe that this meets all the criteria for the reasons that were in that you know, 90 page uh, staff report and certainly what was presented tonight and uh, certain many of the comments that were made as well, I think uh, what was included addressed that. Councilman Peters. Um, I think it was a great presentation. I think it was very clear. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't think we owe anyone a rezoning, but I think you've definitely made an argument for it and it's a better and more consistent fit, I think, than um, what we have actually, which like, Pat said, we've, we like it being empty, but it's not going to stay that way. So I think this is a great fit, and it, the traffic's proven, the consistency, and the compatibility. Anybody else? Hey, excuse me, in the back, can you guys go talk out in the hall? We're still trying to have a meeting here. Anybody else? All right, I'll jump in. Um, as far as this, um, I do think it... Uh, meets all the criteria um, and none more than the, the changing conditions. Um, that's, you know, we have a big vacant uh, uh, office unit right there that's, you know, that's not being utilized. Huge changing conditions um, and uh, the, everything else with the comprehensive plan falls into place with the housing needs that we need here in the community. Um, and so I will be supporting the, uh, this resolution tonight. So does anyone else have any other comments? Hi. Can I add that we did hear from Littleton Academy and that they're in favor of it and excited about it as well? So for those who are concerned about that school, which is right there, it seems like they're excited about it. Great, so we do have a motion and a second to approve a uh, resolution. I'm gonna open the voting. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, on to item D, ordinance 40. Yeah. I'll make, this. I'll make that uh, motion, if that's okay. Ordinance, I move to approve ordinance 40-2023, an ordinance on second reading, approving a rezoning of a portion of 700 West Mer uh, Mineral Avenue from Industrial Park Plan Overlay District, uh, IP dash slash PL dash O, to multifamily residential. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 40, which uh, uh, resumes, rezones portion of this parcel. Uh, comments, Council? Uh, Mayor Portel? Just reiterating what I formed in, the, in a question to uh, one of the consultants, but uh, the traffic mitigation, again, looking only at this parcel, um, the, con the consideration is undue congestion, noise, and traffic hazards. I believe that the consultant has shown through their traffic study um, that there is not going to be an undue congestion as a result of this uh, housing development. I believe that all the other criteria with regards to the consistency, compatibility, and adequate public facilities and actually enhancing significantly uh, natural environment away from a uh, empty parking lot is uh, all speaking in favor. So I'm gonna be supporting this ordinance. Councilman Driscoll. Ditto. Anybody else wanna chime in? Um, so you know what I will um, say I yeah I'll agree exactly with Councilman Barr. Um, I think it meets all the criteria, and the only um, 
Only one that, you know, is um, somewhat um, cause for concern is the traffic, but I agree it's not an undue congestion. Um, yeah, it's, there, there will be more traffic than there is right now, but that's, that's life, so. All right, um, any other comments, Council? Seeing none, I will open the voting on approval of uh, Ordinance 40. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Let's see. And I believe the next item is 11, which is adjournment. And we are adjourned at 10.50. And take next week off, Council. Good work. <laughs>